Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 375 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney. My friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. Lots to get to this week, boys. We've got a pair of awesome interviews coming up, but we were down south, Atlanta for Biz and Grinelli, then the rest of us were in Nashville for the big game at the stadium series. Looks like you boys are still recovering from a long weekend. Let's check and see how we're feeling. Mikey G, you did a lot of traveling. How you doing, buddy? I feel great. Uh, great weekend in Atlanta. Me and Biz got to hit the Jello uh, Jello dunk tank, so that was awesome. And then I headed over to Nashville, which was, uh, again, great time. Pink Whitney party, R.A.M. Unfortunately, you couldn't be there. I'm sure you'll get into that, but... Uh, a big week of content ahead. Tons of uh, Barstool content for the Barstool hockey team from Chicklets Cup is dropping. So I'm pretty excited. I feel good, all right? Yeah, we got some good stuff coming on YouTube with our buddy Patrick Shop a little later this week. But Paul Biz Nasty, Bissonette, your feet must be tired from tap dance. And we'll get to that shortly. But how you feeling, brother? Is, is RA on fast forward right now? Like, uh, did you do Death Wish coffee before you hopped on? No, just uh, just two cups. But I, I should probably stick to one. I think two, I think two gets me a little <laughs> too revved up. I can't even keep up right now. My fucking brain scrambling. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was a great week of hockey, guys. It was fun. Uh, G mentioned we got to get down uh, south for the the ECHL game with Derek Nesbitt. He played it, or he already played in his thousand, but we did the celebration game. G, there must have been what six thousand people there. Uh, of course, everything w- went as scripted. It's like we were um, we were the Wizard of Oz, kind of orchestrating everything. He ended up with a goal and assist. Turned out to be first star. Incredible pregame speech, postgame speech. This guy was meant for the mic. So uh, we're excited, man. We got two really really fun videos for the ECHL Jungle Series coming out. Uh, that's all brought to you by Laundry Sauce, as you can see on my shirt. But Going back to that dunk tank, though, G, like, I, if you want to touch that thing before we hopped in it, uh, before the game had started, I think we'd both have third degree burns because they had to make the jello with the warm, wadi, warm water that they use for the Zamboni wit. So this thing was like scalding hot. I still so, can't feel my feet. <laughs> So when we got dunked in it, because we, we they put so much ice in it, they thought it was now at that point like room temperature. Well, we get dunked, and at the bottom, it took a second for me to kick in, and then I'm like, "Oh shit, it's still hot at the bottom." So no I'm trying way. to get my feet up. Oh well, yeah, because I was buddy. filming him. I had I had him <laughs> filming on on the phone, and I'm like ripping on him. I'm like, "Ha ha, Biz, you got dunked," and he's looking at me like, "Help, help!" And then finally, he looked at me like, "Fucking help me now, or I'm gonna kill you." And I'm yeah, like, "Oh you know my what, god, though? there's there's something wrong here." Hey, it's kind of like it's kind of like the East Coast League, dude. That's that's the that's the coast right there. You go down there, you get third degree burn. If it was an NHL dunk tank, you'd probably have a foot massage down at the bottom of it. Yeah, so that just true. shows what that league's all about. That's you true. dealt with yeah. the elements. Get the Manny Petty at the bottom of the NHL dunk tank, plus a tug. That's the voice of the Wit Dog, of course. Wit, you probably heard the most of us. I mean, two nights in Nashville. That's like a couple nights in Vegas, boy. That town fucking rocks. Yeah, boys. I mean, listen. I'm. I. I would. I would possibly say I'm blessed with one of the sweetest pro job jobs post career you could ever have, but it's slowly killing me. Um, <laughs> we, we've we've been able to go to Vegas. We go on all these trips, and every single time I'm completely waffled the whole time. I don't really know what to do. I don't really know how to approach the next trip. But I'll say this. Nashville is one of the best cities in the country, and I forgot about how cool it was. It is actually a time from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. And in, in, in a way, it's so different than Vegas. There's no casinos and that ruckus and that bullshit to deal with. It's just people having a good old grand time, listening to some phenomenal music, having drinks early, often, and going up and down Broadway. And I know that's a little bit for the touristy. I guess there's other sections of Nashville that maybe people are who live there are more familiar with, a little more chill. But if you're going to chill on Broadway like we did, you're getting after it. And I love that city. It was the best outdoor game I've ever been to or ever seen. We can go into that. But I had a hell of a weekend. And Biz, I actually talked to Grinelli. I'm not going to spoil how the whole game went. But wow, what a storyline for that Atlanta Gladiators game and it, the way it all went down. I can't wait to see the video. Yeah, it's going to be good. Um, As far as the game, it looked awesome on television. Like perfect skyline perfect night to have the game like as far as temperature and and uh they said it was drizzling a little bit did you guys feel it no not no. sweet that's <laughs> 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 me a dick but no, no I, I i didn't even notice it though i went when I, walking over there i didn't i mean it must have happened during the game i didn't see it even falling during the game at all we didn't get but, to mention jason aldeans either what a showing we had there was like a three-hour line just to come take a picture with wit and it was it was unbelievable shout out to jason aldeans and everyone that came out there 
That place is great. Um, so my brother came with me on the trip. Colin went and he got the call. Um, I need to have somebody with me. And, and so we got in on uh, Friday and I went over and I did busting with the boys. So um, for people who aren't aware, check that podcast out. It's under the Barstool Sports Podcast Network. It's Will Compton and Taylor Luan, both NFL guys. Taylor's actually signed like an $80 million contract a few years ago. This guy's a good? stud offensive lineman. Uh, $50 million guaranteed. We talked about that. But I think my episode with them will be coming out Wednesday. We, we shot the shit for like two hours and 40 minutes on the bus. It's a great setup they have. So then I went back and my brother and I just walked up and down Broadway for a couple of drinks. And you don't realize that the talent of of the talent from these musicians playing these little hole in the wall bars is top notch. I mean, you're talking like Chris Stapleton played there before he really started making his way, becoming a big star. Like you have people that are looking to get their chance and to maybe get heard by a powerful person with a record l- label or whatever it may be. So we did that, and then we crushed dinner at Jeff Jeff Ruby's Jeff Rudy's. Great steakhouse. We sat at the bar, great bartenders helping us out. And then above the bartenders, just an unreal band. Guy on the piano. They got the musicians. Just nonstop good good music, good vibes. So then leading into the next day, I was like, all right, well, this street's already banging. And the thing was that I think if you go to Nashville on any normal weekend, like a Saturday, it's going to be maybe not as crazy as it was this weekend, but but bumping nonetheless. So we hit up a couple bars leading into Aldine's. And when we got to Aldine's, the line was, I probably got there at like 2.30. We, were, we started something with some New Amsterdam Gallo folks at 3, but the line was down the block. I couldn't believe it. And they have a roof deck bar. They had a middle section where we were, then a downstairs. The guy told me that a normal Saturday, 7,000 people go through Jason Aldine's bar in Nashville. Wow. So they must just be hammering, hammering money away in that they, place. They, because they get you with a cover charge too or what? I don't think so that was like the uh, sundowner in niagara falls they would get like well like that's a strip a, club well i know but i'm just saying like fuck you think about <laughs> seven thousand through the, the the door at 20 a pop like you are just printing it and i I'm, i apologize the fans for the four yeah. you who came out to see and, me I, I could i had travel snafus i got delayed and i, I basically barely made the game i, I it sucks because that's why i wanted to get down there so apologies to, to the nashville fans like i said who, who are coming out to, to maybe say hello I, I did bump into a few years out in the street but uh all right, don't, don't doubt missed. yourself. There was a lot of people in line that said, where's R.A.? Where's oh, R.A.? 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 R.A. Four people. A lot of people were like, where is he? I was like, oh, he's doing drugs around the corner. He'll be inside in a minute. Don't worry. <laughs> I wish. Hey, they're uh, like, oh, he sent a bat signal out for some flour, and everybody's here to drop it off. Yeah, 17 um, pounds on fucking Broadway. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boys, I actually, I was walking, so... into, walking into the Aldeans, I saw a kid. It was... Like I said, like one thirty, two o'clock as we were kind of starting our trek up Broadway and some kids just smothered. Actually holding a body armor, which I love. Like he probably his buddy's like, take this body armor. It's great when you're waffle, try to sober yourself up. And just like immediately just like and puked all over the sidewalk. Nah. I'm like, holy shit, this game doesn't start for five hours. But the meet and greet was great. I want to thank everyone for coming out. It was an absolute pleasure. Two lunatics. I'll tell you these people, though. They're out of their mind biz. Our fans are crazy. First off, almost every single person in line had a chiclet, some sort of merch on. So said thank you to all of them for actually spending money to rep our brand. It's the biggest honor. I really appreciate it, as we all do. And then one one guy came up with a sick um, Saros jersey. And he's like, hey, will you sign this jersey? I'm like, dude. What you don't? I don't. I don't think you want me to sign this. He's like, no, sign. I'm like, I'm gonna ruin the jersey, bro. This guy's one of the best goalies in the league. I'm on a, a retired scrub, no doubt. He wanted me to sign it, so I signed it like big name right on the letter. I don't know why it's now ruined. And then a Bolts fan shows up with the brand new Tampa Bay Lightning outdoor jersey, Stamkos captain, and he has me sign the Stamkos jersey yeah, too. I go, what are jersey, you guys bro. doing? What's I'm, wrong I'm like with you? angry but, right now. When I, when I was <laughs> in, angry, did you actually Detroit, sign them? Yes, I, but I told him, dude, gonna, you don't we're gonna want fist me to sign fight next time I see you. Biz, when what I was, was in I Detroit, to do? say no to a fan. Kid, this, Punch no, him I, in the I, face. I, I, I did in Detroit with, and no, a couple guys asked me. They wanted me to sign their Bob Probert jersey. I, I said I can't. I just can't. Like to face a Bob Probert jersey, I, this, I'm not worthy of signing a Bob Probert jersey. I politely declined. Normally, I, you know, I'm eager to sign. I'm, fuck, I, I mean, it's funny because I always practiced my autograph in the fourth grade, but it was my real name, not my fucking future nickname. But I couldn't, in good faith, sign up, find a Bob Probert jersey. I'd feel like an asshole doing that. Guys, real quick, you guys yeah. are speaking of jerseys. The Barstool team jerseys oh. go on sale this oh, year in the Barstool Sports oh. Store. Oh. Nice. Yeah, a lot I'm of glad you guys. Uh, uh, 
I'm glad, I'm glad you guys got reminders of how cool you are signing jerseys. So I uh, obviously <laughs> we couldn't go to the game, you know, big, big bit of a, a work call. So I ended up going over my buddy Donnie Superstein's last night for dinner with, you know, uh, his son, Joey. Pasha was there because they're buddies. And uh, I'm trying to have a relaxing night. And, and for whatever reason, Pasha wants to remind me this one time that we're on the street in Vancouver and we were going to get some film gear. And we bump into this guy, I know, like I know him like, you know, he's kind of like an acquaintance more than like a buddy. And, you know, I was just kind of jammed up thinking about this film project and the camera work we were going, or the camera uh, equipment we were going to get. And I was just like, Doesn't oh, so, like is you. It, so so he was with his, his girlfriend and I dropped the, oh, so is this your mom? And just like, <laughs> <laughs> like was obviously she old? like, that, no, like I don't, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's just one of those fucking brain farts. Like it's one of those ones where. I think it's worse when you drop the like, oh, so like, you know, when you do oh. and she's oh, like, that's oh, the, that, like, that's, that. the oh. that's top tier, oh, my foot Cringe. in your mouth. But he decides to remind me of this. And you, you know when somebody brings you back to this most uncomfortable moment and then now for the next 20 minutes, you, 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 you go right back to that awkwardness you had when you had to end that conversation yeah. after seeing that guy's reaction to your fucking question if his girlfriend's his mom. So uh, that was uh, that's how I spent most of my light, night last night. But uh, it was good to see Pasha. We also edited, uh, sat down and edited a behind the scenes vlog video for our experience at Chicklet Cup, uh, Chicklet's Cup, excuse me, with uh, the Big Deal Select. So we're gonna have some a video coming out Wednesday. G yours drops what Tuesday? So uh, the Barstool videos drop Monday and Wednesday, and the Chicklet's vlog will drop Thursday. All right. And then we have a full-on video series from the Chicklets Cup that's being edited by Sean. And then, of course, it's incredible. Yeah, we got some we got some awesome uh, stuff coming to our YouTube channel, guys. Like we didn't really have the ability when everything was shut down to be together as much as we wanted. Of course, not throwing these live events. So uh, we're gonna keep pouring this stuff on. We got more sandbaggers coming. Uh, I'm not gonna divulge who and wit. I think you already know who the guy is, but I'm gonna be getting some. some golf lessons here in Scottsdale from like nice. Thank a God. golf Thank legend. God. Well, f- well, hey, I've been carrying my weight in the last couple, so I don't want to hear you. And and hey, the putter's been on, buddy. TNT golf and business has been on. Yes or yeah, no? I know. Uh, um, yeah, you've been you've been you've been solid. There's a lot of room for improvement, and I've been begging. I'm more. I'm not clapping to say like, oh my God, like. You need to get a lesson like, oh, we're fucked. I'm more clapping because I've been asking you to get a le- couple lessons for a couple of years. So I'm fired up. Yeah. Well, hey, sometimes things happen for a reason. I know there was a reason I waited. And wait till you see, folks, who I got helping me with my swing. I might even wind up three quarters now. I might get rid of the Jovanovsky special with the short backswing with the stiff shaft. <laughs> so I'm excited to see what I can do. All right, boys, before we get to the game, I do want to mention the two guests I, I alluded to earlier. We have Vancouver Canucks goalie Thatcher Demko, who's been absolutely killing it lately. Got the Canucks, I think, three points out of the playoffs right now. And Canadian Women's Olympic gold medal winner Natalie Spooner joined us for a nice chat. So we got a couple of great interviews coming later. Also, I saw you boys were fueled up pretty good with the old Pink Whitney this weekend. There was lots of it in Nashville and Atlanta. And you, too, can enjoy the fine taste of Pink Whitney at your local package store. Or you can belly up to your favorite local joint and order some there. Either way, be sure to get your hands on some Pink Whitney. Speaking of uh, Pink Whitney, yeah. um, mm-hmm. sorry. Uh, oh. At one of the uh, watering holes that Colin and I jumped into on Friday night, um, I could tell the guy, like, he heard me say something to my brother. And, like, the guy, there's a guy near me with, with a woman. And he kind of, like, snapped his head. Like, I think he's like, oh, I recognize that voice. And so he's kind of, like, looking. He said, hey, are, are you Ryan Whitney? I said, yeah, what's going on, man? So we're just shooting. He's like, oh, big fan of the show. And. Actually, I got to tell you, uh, this is my girlfriend here, and we met through Pink Whitney. We met because of Pink Whitney. I had a Pink Whitney drink at a bar in Toronto. He's actually from a town. He said he's from like 45 minutes from Welland. I don't remember the name of the town, but um, then he saw this this girl who he's now dating. She ordered a shot of Pink Whitney, and he's like, hey, is that Pink Whitney? She's like, yeah, I love it. So they started chatting it up, and boom, now they're dating, going on road trips to Nashville, just smashing each other the whole three nights, I'm sure. <laughs> Smash so, so, so <laughs> I, I, so I they, like, so they wow. tagged you in? So they tagged you in? We could like, I was going to say, Biz. <laughs> you want to lay my no, old lady? No, I put Colin in. I tagged Colin in for me. <laughs> Wit's got the gag ball in his mouth in these people's yeah. room. Hey, what a great... <laughs> what a coinky dink, up, man. I, I dressed up as a giant bottle of Pink Whitney, but one of those, like, 
things outside the, the gold stores costume. that are fluttering around. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to say it. Come on, uh, Ari, you got to know that. Yeah, the, the swiggling, wig- wiggle I'm in, they hit the used car lots, yeah. Oh, it's I like thought a, for sure you'd be able to rattle I, that off. I know, it's, I think it might be an old family guy joke, but uh, either way, man, listen, first off, I got to shout out the Lightning fans, like, there were so oh many Tampa God. Bay fans. I know, these, you know, fans travel every trip, and people still kind of have a stigma with Florida, the state of Florida fans, not Florida Panther fans, but... Tampa Bay, man, they showed out big time. Tons of fans. It was great to, to talk to a lot of them, interact with them. Uh, the game itself, actually, before we get to the game, we got to congratulate, congratulate Pekka Rene. His number 35 got retired. First Predator ever to have his number retired. Uh, he's actually getting a statue as well. So uh, big shout out to Pekka Rene. Huge part of that franchise. But the game itself, man, Tampa went 3 2. Very, very chippy affair, Biz. For two teams with really no history, they're in de- different conferences. Uh, of course, early in the game, Ryan Johansson, he catches Eric Chernak with a shoulder to the head. Uh, it was initially called a major. Uh, they reviewed it. They put it down to two minutes for an illegal check to the head. Chernak tried to get back in the game, couldn't, and that kind of set the tone for the game. Were you surprised, Biz, that it got overruled from a five-minute to a two-minute, and why, uh, why do you think so? Yeah, so I think my initial opinion was, and I thought Cernak was going to come back. It looked harmless. I liked the fact that he was able to keep playing. I don't think it was malicious at all, and I understand the the, the rule is if you make head contact – but in my opinion, he didn't target it. What what happens sometimes is guys towards the end of their shift, wit, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, when they go in to just put an easy body check on a defender, like Cernak's trying to kind of dodge him a little bit and then also make the play. But he comes, he comes up. It looks as if though he jumped, but it wasn't a jump. And I don't even think he was off the ice by the time he made contact. He just kind of came up on the hit. And when you do that, sometimes you do run the risk now to make head contact and head contact first. So the semantics of it did not look good. Um, I was happy that the ref decided to to take away the five and just make it a two. But then to see that he didn't come back, it's like, fuck, I'm more of an eye for an eye guy. I don't think he should get games for it, but he should should have probably left the game. And then I guess you could say, when you talk about eye for an eye, there was later in the game, um, I think jo- uh, Johansson got hooked on a breakaway, and it probably should have been a penalty shot. Maybe they didn't call because he got the shot off eventually, but they just ruled it a penalty. So yeah, I, saw I thought that, that, that was- I, I just felt that the game was well officiated given the circumstances of, as you mentioned already, that hit, the chippiness went off the rails. But I will say, I guess I underestimated Nashville's size. They got some really big guys in the lineup, and the camera an- angle they had on for the TV, it was a little bit lower, so you kind of had a closer angle to the ice. You really saw the size of, of how big they are and, and, and you know how physical they like to play. But as we know about Tampa Bay, man, like they can play any way you want because they're just as big. We talk about the big guys on the back end, and and they can match that physicality and a big ru- uh, a big reason why why Patty Maroon so fucking valuable. Um, and I, I, I should mention, I'd say half the people going through the meet and greet prior to the game were also, shout out Grinelli, I wrote this down, I just checked my notes. Grinelli, a minimum of 15 shots of Pink Whitney he did. I don't even know how you were standing up after that meet and greet. You were like fine by the end of the game too, but you were in one. I respected the hell out of you it. You know why? Because it was the second night. The, the, I think the day before he had a couple too. So, you know, the second day of vacation, you always get that like... Oh, I thought it was because you weren't there to yell at him. So I was maybe I'm mistaken. Oh, fuck. (laughs) Oh, my God. About what? I'm fucking around. But listen, so half the people, uh, they said to me, like, who are you betting on? Who are you betting on? I said, and guys, no offense. And I don't mind at all if Nashville wins. But Tampa Bay Lightning, they are the Alabama in football. You just don't make money betting against them. I said, I'm on Tampa. It's just this the, the way that team plays, and I know you're just talking about size, and I think besides having the best goalie in the world, their D is so big, I've talked about it. But when you talk about size on Nashville, that Tanner Janot is one hell of a fucking hockey player. He's out there running. I don't know if it was us. I don't know if it was McDonough. It was one of the big defense in the Tampa has. Basically, all of them are. He trucked them. You could tell he was kind of like taken aback. And maybe it was Hedman. I don't know. But he's just out there. Like, he plays Sissons as the center. And then they got that Trennan, that monster on the other wing. It's like, that team is legit. And I don't know what's going to happen. We can get into the whole Forsberg rumors later in the show. Yeah. But you're right, Biz. I was impressed by Nashville's size. And in terms of the game, the other thing for viewers at the stadium, which I'm guessing also people watching at home got to experience, was... 
The microphones were the best I've ever heard for a game. They must have had 50 of them down near the ice. You could hear every single skate blade, every pass, every check. You could hear the refs talking to each other. It was unreal the setup the league did in terms of like getting to hear some real audio from down low to the ice, especially when you're in a stadium holding 70,000 people. But in terms of also the game... I want to shout out Cal Foot, dude. What a pass he gave to Stamkos on that one goal. And I got to meet Adam Foot the day before. I recognized him, said we'd love to have him on the show. One of the friendliest guys I've ever met. He said, we can make that work, no doubt. So pretty cool he's there watching his son play. He goes, yeah, it's, it's a tough city to go home at night in. So I'm sure he knew from playing that that Nashville, they, they bring the thunder. But um, other than that, the game just showed that Vasilevsky is like, why I'll never really pick against the Lightning. I think because I made the Islanders my preseason pick, that's gone real well. They've looked real good to win the Stanley Cup. I'm going back to the Lightning. They're my pick again. I'm I'm done fucking around with anyone else. I'm on Tampa again. I picked them last year, and this team is built to win any way you play, just like you said, Biz. So I think that that game showed, even with Nashville playing a big, sl- not slow-style hockey, but not really offensive and not run and gun, Tampa says no problem. Also, uh, a couple of fights, man. Uh, uh, buddy, the big rig, Pat Maroon, I saw him afterwards in Tootsies, and I was like, dude, what was it like fighting in front of 68,000 people? He's like, it was it was unreal. Him and Mike McCarron went at it. Nice little tilt. Uh, and then Joe Hansen, you know, basically had to answer for Santino in the second period. P.E. Belma went right at him off the faceoff. Maroon actually gave him a little shot. So we had a couple scraps in the game. Um, but, yeah, very entertaining game. Also, we got to shout out the Worm. Uh, prior to the with the Classic, he scored his 400th career goal. Uh, in his 14th of the season, Biz, this guy's playing a bottom six role. He's kind of signed for veteran leadership and depth. Uh, 14 goals. I'm not sure people are expecting that out of him. He He's said, uh, he said, Timu rubbed off on him. All the stretching that created the longevity. Where was he a big stretcher when you were there? Yeah, he was. I actually got to run into Perry. We were staying at the Joseph, so where Tampa uh, was also staying. I saw I saw Big Rig the night before. I saw the Worm, and it was funny. I hadn't seen Perry in so long. You forget he's such a nice guy. He's a quiet guy too. Like he's, but we got to catch up just quickly before he was heading to dinner in the lobby. But uh, I said congratulations on your four hundredth. I said, buddy. You're still getting it done out there. He goes, these guys are so fast with. They're so <laughs> fucking fast. But, you know, he does his thing in front of the net. And I do remember he was super into, like, stretching. I mean, he's a driven guy. That's why he's been playing yeah. this long. But um, I didn't know that, that he was saying that's something that, that he's really jumped into lately, maybe. Is that what you're saying from your interview with him? No, well, just like I think like more so later in his career, guys like really emphasized it when he was in Montreal. So he really rubbed off the young guys in like a positive way about like how to prep and take care of yourself post-practice, pre-practice, post-game, wh- whatever it may be. But so I, I used to play against him growing up. He played for the, the Peterborough team and fuck, dude, he was sick when we were playing minor hockey. They beat us in the OMHA final. Uh, then they ended up beating us in the OHL cup, like the year of our draft. And I, I think he ended up going fourth overall to the London Knights, but just, just a guy who has a knack for around the net always, it was always like that. Always was able to step up in big moments too, uh, throughout his entire career. And like, I'll be honest, right? Like I wasn't watching him that closely when he was finishing off in Anaheim and how kind of maybe ugly things had gotten and really negative and, to see how he's able to kind of push through that and and continue to do it. And now, you know, I think it's his 16th season, I believe. And I think he's got 14 goals right now and, and, and he's playing in a limited role. And when he ended up scoring the 400, did you like, did you see when he went by the bench? Like, it's not easy to get that type of uh, love and, 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 and emotion from teammates when you've been hopping around and you haven't really spent much time there. And you could just kind of sense like, He's fit in like a fucking glove and and it's just like he's he's just kind of like a an unbelievable teammate guy and I'm I'm really happy for the guy. Like to to see the fact that he's still getting it done. Yeah, that was a pretty cool scene. I think he actually did like a 360 during the yeah. the, the, the tap line cuz they were all grabbing at him and stuff. It was a cool scene, but uh what you were talking about the music uh on Broadway earlier. I don't know, the big rig might be getting recruited. That could be a second career cuz a- afterwards I went to Tootsie's after the game late night. I think the whole Tampa Bay staff and, and players were in there. The big rig was up on stage singing his heart out, dude. He was up there for like an hour, like had his ta- his tab open at the bar. It, it was awesome stuff. But the highlight of the night, Paul, Biz Nasty, Bissonette, did you take tapping jazz as a kid? Where did that footwork come from? You look like river dance out there. Uh, me and Whit watched it in the box, and we were fucking in <laughs> We were fucking dying when we saw that. Where did I that just, come from? 
I don't know. They said, let's see your two-step. And I don't really know how to two-step. And like a couple times I've done that stupid river dance thing. But boys, I'm telling you what, my fucking, I had to go. The reason I sound so tired is I just came out of a two and a half hour massage. My legs were killing me the next day after that. I thought I popped my ACL out again. My fucking Achilles were bugging me. But yeah, I just kind of like figured it out. And then at, towards the end, I did the old, uh, the old dumb and dumber. <laughs> off the set and 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 fucking Wayne always belly laughing. So anytime you can get Wayne having a good time, it's uh, I'm down for it. The scene was so good, but when I I laughed even harder watching Gretzky like die laughing, and I was I was impressed, bro. That was that was legit footwork. That proved I think, you could skate too. I think that I was just so happy. Like those demos are difficult, and like right before we ended up doing the uh, the demo, like talk it like took control, and he's like, "This is what you're gonna do. This is how we're gonna frame it." And this because we wanted to talk about the half wall, and sometimes you don't really know how to snap it around for the opinions, but it worked out perfectly because Liam opened it up. Uh, threw it over to Gretz. Gretz touched on the half wall point about how Kucherov, like, did you, talk, did, you, did you see it? Were you able to hear it? No, no. I mean, I just saw the clip that went viral. So, so talk mentioned, like, as a talking point, if we needed to do a demo, we should talk about the half wall and how special they are on the power play that they have the, the dual threats on each side. Well, sure as shit, their fucking first goal, it was a perfect scene. Entry, uh, zone entry. Kalorin lifts the guy's stick on the far side. It goes to Kucherov on the half wall. Kucherov comes up, goes back down because he ends up dodging one of the guys and he has the area for the stick and throws a beautiful little backhand pass into Point. Now, Point ends up knocking the thing out of the air. It was a stunning hand-eye reaction. So Wayne was able to break it down and explain how important that is. Now, on the second goal... The, that low forward or the, the forward on that side, the strong side, ends up coming down to take the point away, like where, where point was. And sure as shit, they slide it right back to the defenseman. So it just, he was, we were able to ha- highlight how, like, once one thing closes on this unreal power play, they're going to expose you in another way. So then Anson talked about where point was. And then Talkett mentioned the guy coming down on the second one and how they were able to adjust. And then I just picked up the, the trash with the, how Kalorn lift the stick on the far side. He doesn't get an assist, but he makes the play that keeps it going around. And then he creates the screen on the second goal. So it all flowed nicely. So we were just happy. And then that's when I think everybody was just kind of like jubilated that we did it. And, like, and he goes, let's see your two-step. And then boom, <laughs> fucking out of the gate. And then we, uh, then it all ended. And we, you know, afterward, we're pumped. It's a good team win. We got the fucking demo out. We did the stupid fucking dance. And everybody's having a good time, right? So that's kind of how TV works. And it was good teamwork by talk and Liam and everybody. And, uh, and you know, and then you end up getting a viral clip out of it. I yeah. saw, uh, I saw Kalorn too. He was saying, dude, that biz, he doesn't stop working. I see him TNT. I see him chicklets and he's still doing those coyotes games too. I go, yeah, he's brought him a lot of luck this year. It's been good, <laughs> but he was pumping up your work ethic, bro. Shout out to you. Well, he's the content king of the NHL. I mean, yeah, he is. He what, is. What, he what, what do they call too, with the shades he had on warmups? What's his? Uh, I, I'm forgetting his go-to name. Doc now. talks. Like, Doc, Doc talks. talker. The content king. Doc talker. He knows. He knows how hard it he is. He wants to get us all in the, a sandbagger. You bad, don't think huh? it was a pain in the ass getting the logistics going to get five guys in their jet skis out on on a day together? <laughs> Especially, we're talking about Stamkos and uh, and Vasilevsky, a couple uh, studs on the team. Ross Colton wants you guys in the sandbag too. I, I bumped into him and uh, Taylor Radish when I got something. Oh, that I thought rookie that, can wait. That I, yeah, rookie he, can wait his he, turn. He, he I said on there, rookie. bag. He, I, I thought they were locals because they had all the denim and cowboy hats on. I didn't like. I said, seen the the clip of the going in the game, but I was like, hey, what's up? And then like, hey, what? I shook his hand. I thought he was local. He's like, hey, Ross Colton, Taylor. I was like, oh, fucking, you guys are the light. And I didn't even realize they were fucking lightning players because they they had all the Nashville getup on. But yeah, they they want a sandbag at some point, but. They could probably got to pay their dues. But listen, boys, if you told me like 35, 40 years ago that someday I'd be at an NFL stadium in Nashville watching an NHL game between teams from Tennessee and Florida, I'd be like, what are you smoking and can I have some? <laughs> but this is all the Gretzky effect. We just talked about Wayne Gretzky. You know, this is a ripple effect from him getting traded to L.A. back in 1988. And it led to the expansion everywhere, teams everywhere that they weren't. And, and now we're getting these outdoor games in Nashville. And, Biz, you guys did a hilarious bit uh, as well. We go back to TNT that they retired his sweater vest. And yeah. they, they brought it down from the rafters, and they had all these NHL stars come on and talk. I was pissing myself laughing. And you know what? 
Wayne getting his balls busted and laughing about it, it was like, okay, man, if Wayne can laugh at getting his balls busted, then, then anybody can. He takes it as good as anybody. He, he was one of the boys. It was just an awesome thing to see. Yeah, him coming out of the gate, uh, episode one, with the, with the sweater vest really paid dividends. And, yeah, the fact that they did the work to get all those guys to comment. But I'm pissed, though. Not, now none of us get to wear any because it's retired. So uh, you'll never see me with the, the, the NCAA college coach special. I thought <laughs> we were going to come out with some pink Whitney sweater vest, right, Grinelli? <laughs> we're going to have to put those on the shelf, pal. Sorry. The, the best is Jason Robinson on Dallas City. He goes, uh, I've, I've paid homage by not ever wearing a sweater vest my whole life, which is fucking well, hilarious. It was like a subtle shot, but funny. All right, I think it. it's such a fair point to bring up. And, and obviously, he's had a, a major impact on the fact that the, the, the NHL was able to grow in the South. I ended up throwing up a tummy stick tweet um, online about just thanking the NHL and all the people behind the scenes that put these things on, guys. Like, there, there's a lot of people putting in a lot of work to, to make these things go as flawless as possible. And Whit, from your tweet, it seemed like this is probably one of the better ones that ever went down. I, I think part of it was that it was perfect weather. It was a little chilly for Nashville, say 45, 50 degrees, but... Added to that, the music, and I know I mentioned the bars, and people probably think I'm blowing smoke. I'm not even the biggest country music guy, but they had big-time performers every single TV break. The first intermission was Dirks Bentley, a rock and show where it was pretty much like a concert in the stadium, and that along with, um, this is a kind of a minor detail, but the area around the ice down on the field can sometimes just be like, I don't know. Like sometimes it doesn't look great depending on what they have. They had those huge wild music notes and all this black setup. So it just made the whole setup and the way the guys walked out next to each other with the anthem singer at the end. It was just, it was definitely the best scene. I think part of it was the party atmosphere and how close it was to downtown, right? When you're able to just walk like three minutes over to the stadium, it kind of changes the whole vibe of like where you're going to pregame and where you're going to postgame gives, party. Gives you a chance to sober up too, that little walk, just some fresh air. Yeah. Yeah, unless you're G. <laughs> also got to shout out Miranda Lambert. She was a, another singer. I think she was uh, at the same time as Dirk Bentley. And I think uh, Gretzky is coming from my job biz when he dropped a, a gun smoke res- reference when he called you Festus. I, I know nobody on the set got it except maybe Liam, a 1960 show gun smoke. I was like, oh, Gretzky with the old school reference here. So, uh, but like I said, it, it wasn't all fun and games uh, with Gretzky talking. And he took a, a very hard stance. And this is where we got to kind of shift into real world matters, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the, what's going on the last uh, week in the world, Russia uh, declaring war or invading Ukraine, just absolutely ridiculous stuff. Uh, but Wayne come out and, and he said he, he thinks Russia shouldn't be allowed to play in the world juniors because they are in Edmonton this year. And, you know, there's only so many ways you can send a message. And by not allowing them to come, it kind of tells the rest of the country, hey, this is how much of an asshole you have in charge. It's a, it's a dictator doing di- dictatorial things. And he also kind of stuck up for Ovechkin. He said, Alex isn't driving this bus. Uh, and he said, why would, why? And also, I, I think it was Dominic Kashuk said that Russian players should be sent home, which is kind of a, an odd take. He went and, off the rails. Yeah. And Wayne said, well, why, why send just hockey players back? Like, why pick on hockey if you're going to send people back to Russia, which is just a crazy thing? Why, why just send hockey players? But uh, either way, you know, Wayne's not a, a guy known for making kind of declarative statements like that. But, but it, was, it was nice to see him come down. And I think it was an easy call given what the fuck's going on with the, that idiot in charge of Russia. But kudos to Wayne. Um, so maybe Hashik's comments and the fact he said hockey players, which I don't agree with, is deriving from the fact of I don't know how many other professional athletes in North America are vocal or because I don't even know when I say vocal, I'm assuming that Ovechkin has said vocal things in support of 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 uh, Putin. I don't know what they personally are. So obviously, that's probably where he's catching so much of the flack. Um, his Instagram photo is also him and Putin, but like wit going back a little bit too, I don't know exactly when the hockey players met them, but I remember a picture with, uh, Malkin coming out next to him and Malkin kind of had the funny point and look, whereas I don't remember reading about Malkin's opinion on, on Putin either. I think the only guy who's had a strong opinion opposed to him has been Panarin in the NHL. Um, I don't really think that the criticism is warranted in the fact that if if Ovechkin really hasn't said anything much in support other than the fact that, like, does he even really have a fucking choice? Because things are a little bit different over there and, like, shit's fucking scary. And when Panarin was not in support of, of, of Putin, um, 
I believe that they made up like a fake story about how he like assaulted someone. So like, there's like the, there's also a fear based component. Uh, I, I also wouldn't be the type of media manager where I'm like, I need a, answers from Alex Ovechkin about the fact that Putin's invading fucking Ukraine. Like that's where for me, I'm like, okay, maybe they're a little frustrated at the fact that they've, he supported this guy, but like direct your anger somewhere else. Like you're, you're, you're now all of a sudden, in my opinion, making it more about yourself than the actual matter at hand. And is that, like, you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I think that, um, I, I think that that guy is a straight up fucking lunatic. He's a yeah. horrible human being. And what I'm, and I'm talking about Putin, obviously. So when I look at all this, it's like, I really have a hard time judging NHL players from Russia. I respect the hell out of Artemi Panarin for what he said, because he's on the right side of things at the yeah. same time. Alex Ovechkin and Evgeny Malkin and Ilya Kovalchuk when he was here and a lot of these guys, I mean, that's where they grew up. As o- as Ovi said in his press conference, he's my president. His family is over in Russia. Like, what do you expect here? I I, I don't I don't agree at all with these reporters saying he needs to sh- he needs to answer questions. It's like he's from there. He has no he he's not he's not American. He's not Canadian. He ne- doesn't even necessarily see how awful what is actually happening is. And I'll say this, Ovi did a good job. He said, I, I wish for peace. I don't want there to be a war. I thought that was pretty good. And maybe you're rolling your eyes at what I'm saying. To be from Russia and to have this fucking lunatic looking over you with where your family is, to even say you hope for peace and wish there wasn't a war, that's kind of speaking out against this madman. Um, so it's an awful, awful scenario. My heart is with everyone in the Ukraine and these people. And let me tell you, these fucking people are tough as nails. They are amazing right now. You're seeing yeah. stories of 50, 60-year-old men going down, getting weapons, and being prepared to fight. People leaving, as Gretzky mentioned, driving their family across the country to hopefully get them out of the Ukraine and turning right around and just preparing for battle. It's such an awful thing what's, what Russia's doing. What I say when I was there, that place sucks. So I feel so bad for these people in Ukraine. I, I, I We all hope and pray that this comes to an end and that Putin fucking gets off his crazy-ass high chair and tries to try to at least like get i don't i don't know i don't even know where you go from here it's tr- it's hard to even um, talk about something like this mm-hmm. yeah and then as far as the the kicking them out of either the olympics or world juniors like before there's like a pity party for the fact that you know these kids didn't do anything like these are also the kids that were ripping darts and, and drinking and got kicked off that plane um leaving town when everything ended up getting canceled they also are kids but i think it's more of like it has nothing to do with the kids it has to do with more that that Russia re- needs to realize that there's rest of, there's consequences for their civilians as a result to like what they're doing to other countries. How and, about the kids from Ukraine? <laughs> you know, like, well, there you go. Right. It, it, so it's yeah. just like, y- it's you're nuts. And yeah. FIFA and FIFA, oh, which are cowards the same way the Olympic committee is and the same way the NCAA, they're morons too. They are, FIFA's decided, okay, well, they can play in the World Cup, I think they said, but um, they just have to be like the, they were in the Olympics. Like they can't use the flag. Wear the it's crest, like, and yeah, that's it's not like- that's not a true like sanction. Like they shouldn't be allowed to play. And and obviously, maybe that sounds a little different than us saying that Russian players shouldn't be forced out of the NHL right now. But to represent your your country is a little different than playing over here in America and being over here for twenty years as Ovechkin's been. Yeah. I think most people can understand how ridiculous this is and why they need to probably just tell them to tone it down on the sports for now. They can they can yeah. go they can go think about what's going on over there. Yeah, you need to send a message everywhere to let you know the people know if they're not aware that there's a fucking dictator in charge. Like, hey, the reason you can't come is because of this asshole here. And going back to Ovi, like like you said, a lot of media critical of him because you know he's not going to publicly denounce a madman dictator while his family's in the country. And even if they're not. Even if he come out and said fucking something, that's not going to change anything. All it's going to do is put his family in danger. Like, like, I, I just don't know that all that I don't think that uh, all that criticism is warranted for Ovechkin. He's in a shitty spot. I know we supported him in the past, and I, I didn't grow up in Russia. I, I, I can't speak to his experience, but uh, to expect you know what him it to, changes, like, Ray. You know what it changes? These hero reporters are are then happy. They, they got the answer they wanted. That's what it changes. But it does nothing in the big scheme of things, and it does nothing for Alex Ovechkin and his family's safety. So I, 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 thought, I thought it was pretty good that he came out and said he hopes there isn't a war. I mean, obviously, you, you'd think that he really is, is in disagreement with what's happening, but for him to at least say that was something. 
And uh, there's also been lots of talk about, you know, there's been a lot of support for immediate removal of Russian teams from the IIHF events for the rest of 22, including taking the juniors away next year. Uh, and this just came over uh, Twitter a little while ago. Uh, at uh, Pekka uh, Yalonen, I'm not sure if who this guy works for, but he said inside information, Russia and Belarus will be thrown out of the IIHF Federation in a couple of hours. Apparently, the meeting as we record the show uh, Darren Dreger said there's, that's the sense out there. There's a strong position by the IIHF if they were to do this. Now, I'm skeptical that the I, IIHF is going to do that, what you just mentioned, FIFA and, and the Olympic Committee. These are organizations that in, they're, they're in bed with Russia, basically. And so if the IIHF doesn't invite Russia to the World Juniors, I think that will be a shock. I'll be shocked if it actually happens. But obviously, it's a story we'll monitor. So I don't know if you guys have any closing thoughts before we move along to some uh, happier things here. Just thinking of the people in Ukraine yeah. and a lot of the Ukrainian people that are in the United States and Canada. And I've heard about, a, I've, I've actually had a couple different DMs from people who, have, who are maybe billeting Ukrainian kids playing junior. I know there's a kid uh, in my neighborhood actually from Ukraine living with one of my neighbors. And those are the people you think of who not only can't go home right now, but are also in panic and thinking about their family. So... I mean, not to try to be uh, somebody lecturing, but if you think you're having a bad day right now and, and, and a cuffed couple weeks in your life, it's like just take a look at what's really going on, and, and we're really thinking of those people over there. It's awful. Very well said, Whit. Uh, yeah, like I said, we're all, we're all thinking of other folks in Ukraine, whether they're in the country or around the world. So, all right, uh, moving right along here. Listen, fellas, Biz, I noticed you got your laundry sauce uh, swag on. Your laundry deserves better. Meet laundry sauce the world's first designer laundry detergent made specifically for the lads. At LaundrySauce.com, you'll discover a better way to muck your laundry. Laundry Sauce's premium, simple-to-use laundry pods are made with bold fragrances that will have you smelling like a beauty and feeling like a man rocket. Their carefully crafted detergent doesn't just smell great, it's gentle on your clothing. It's the lady bing of the laundry room. And every order of Laundry Sauce comes with, you guessed it, 69 premium pods per box. Nice, as Biz would say. And if you want to start buzzing out there, then scale up your laundry game by going to LaundrySauce.com. You and your wrench are going to be smelling like a million bucks. All right, Biz. Uh, Saturday night, the wildest game wasn't in Nashville. Toronto at Detroit. The Leafs won 10-7. to They almost blew a 7-2 to lead in true Leafs fashion. Uh, Mitch Bonner, four goals, two assists. But your boy, Mike Bunton, one goal, four assists. Now second in rookie points with 40. He's two behind Lucas Raymond. Tie for goals with 18. Uh, with Tanner Janot. I mean, this kid's rocking biz. I don't know if this. I don't know if this is you manifesting him winning the call or what. But it, uh, the kid's been getting in the race now. Oh my! God. I want to know what Wit thinks of it. I Whit, think it he is, has I been think... lighting the lamp since you doubted him and said hey, that you would hey. put your cock on the line, just hey. like I did last year. Hey, RA. You're a typical Munson and Biz. You're the biggest idiot out there because <laughs> you guys haven't mentioned. Lucas Raymond had a hat trick in the game. He's seven years younger than Bunting, you idiots. And you know who else is better than Bunting? Is the monster defenseman, the next Victor Hedman on the back end, Maurice Sider. He's about 19 years, he's about nine years younger than Bunting. And I actually hate how it's come out where I'm against and don't like Bunting. I love this guy. He is one hell of a player, and he's made that line really tick. I mean, they are monsters together. It's Marner, Matthews. Also, Biz, shout out you. I'm actually on board. Matthews is the greatest Leaf of all time. I yes! switched my opinion in one Welcome week. Welcome aboard, he's, he, buddy. He's, <laughs> dude, he's got 77 goals in his last 100 games. He's going to be, the, I think, the second Leaf ever to have four 40-goal seasons when he gets 40 this year. He is at another level, and Marner looks awesome. And Bunting's a great player, but you cannot compare him. And you know why I'll say it? To Lucas Raymond or Maurice Sider in Rookie of the Year. You know why? Ask 31 GMs, and they'd rather Raymond over Bunting. So in talking about Rookie of the Year, as great as Bunting's been, while being 26 years old, he's not going to win the Calder. It's a great year for him. He comes over from Phoenix. He gets to be a big part of an original six franchise while playing on the top line. And he has five points. And also, the assist to get Marner the fourth goal was so sick. It was a Marner-type assist, a behind-the-back no-look. I'm a big Bunting fan, but keep talking about him for the Calder Trophy, and you prove how stupid you really are. I wow. don't think I've ever really said that he's been ahead of Cider or Raymond once. You've been yelling, Bunting's going to win the Calder. What are you talking about? Because there's still one-third of the season left. And I think that they have a lot of important games coming up, and he's playing with a couple special players. I said that he has the possibility to lap those guys and get past them. To lap them. 
Well, I, I meant to say pass them, not lap them. Come on, you know what the fuck I'm saying. <laughs> hey, hey, sometimes these he's a young great guys, player. Hey, he's also been playing pro for you know five years or whatever it may be. So he's used to this pro schedule. Sometimes these young guys who step in, they tend to fade out on the back half of the season in their rookie year. And I'm not saying that. I think Maurice Sireder is the clear number one right now. I think me too. Raymond's right underneath him. I think that Bunting has to do something pretty special in this last, you know, 30 games or whatever it may be, in order to even give it a chance, especially given his age. But I'm all on the fucking train, dude. Yo, Why Bunting's wouldn't I 20 be? years old. If Bunting's 20 years old, boom, he's right there. It's but the I also. Age. But you've been I, I, going nuts about you're not just talking about how he's a good player. You've been yelling about bunting for Calder, bunting for Calder. You can't yeah, now I know say because he's like, he, he, he's a 26 year old guy who was playing in the coast a couple of years ago, who's all of a sudden put his name in the top three. And I think that we still got some games left here to play. He so, won't even be top yeah. three. Okay, so okay. okay, so what would be the criteria given the fact that you've thrown in the age factor and yep. you're saying he's 26? How much? How many more points and or, or or intangibles does he have to bring in order for him to be able to win it? Or are you telling me there's just not a possibility? I think another season he probably could have won it. Maybe he'd actually be screwed no matter what because of the age and the professional games argument with Kaprizov last year. He might be screwed no matter what. It's more about who he's going against this season for the Calder. And even said that, like I, I guess if he had. If he had 30 goals, 80 points at his age and with who's there with him as rookies, that's probably his only chance. And even then, Raymond's going to end up with 70 points and he's 19. So it's just like, it's more about the age. I love Bunting. So, so I guess, Mike, what, what if he scores eight more goals than him and, and gets 16 more points? I don't think it... I, you, I, you, so if he, so, if he were to win the, scoring, the rookie scoring race by 16 points, you're saying... I'm just wondering what what consideration would you give him at what point as as far as how much his play has to be better given his age? I think I, I just I, I think it's need not 30 a criteria. Goals and 80 points and part of it is biz. I think part of it is voters will look at the fact he's playing with two of the best players in the world, and that's a big factor, dude. It really is. He needs to have a big. He needs to have a big back half here, and he's off to a hell of and a start. You know though. what? You know, hey, you know hey, what's funny fa- though? Let, let me ask you this. Does the fact that he put up a five piece against Detroit not make your fucking dick move just a little bit? I was I was like, this is amazing that this is happening, and Biz <laughs> just keeps talking about it. And like Ari said, he's legit like making it. What's the word, Ari? You said he's manifesting. Like making, manifesting. Oh, man, yeah, manif- yes, I didn't have that one in my so bag. So, Thanks, Ari. Um, but but let, let let's put the bunting with an amazing season. Great job, Bunting. Yeah. Let's put that discussion and the Calder Trophy aside with Zegris, Raymond, Sider, all these studs. Let's talk about what's really going on in Toronto. So Biz has, what's your, okay, you have two Western Conference teams. Yeah, Toronto's your Eastern Conference team, so that's your third favorite team. And they've looked great. Their goalie sucks now. They have no goaltending. I think Campbell's one of the worst goalies in the league since January 1st. And Mrazek's your backup, and this is the year we're getting out of the first round. Oh. Oh, not much cap room. Muzzin, who knows if he's coming back. And now, what do you do about the goaltending, boys? What do you do in Leafland? You guys can't stop the puck now. What no, are you going to th- do, Biz? You don't have I, a goalie. I, I, I'm not concerned at all. I think most teams, I mean, outside the obvious ones, like Shesterkin's having a massive year. Um, Vasilevsky never goes through periods like this. I think it's a pretty strong case for 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 guys who are pretty new to being the starter to go through a little segment like this in their season when they finally get the reins. He had a huge start to the year for him. He's so liked in that locker room. They got Mrazek for that reason. They had the 1A, the 1B coming this season. He'll get the net for a little bit while Campbell fingle, figures out what the fuck he's going to, you know, going to get going moving forward here. He, we know he's going to put in the work because he's got a tremendous work ethic and he's going to level things off before they even get the playoffs. But the, the beauty of it all is like the team's still doing all right considering it. They're still putting up the goals and, and, and giving that offensive support. So I, I, just like you tell me nothing matters till playoffs, like, well, then should goal, goaltending really matter till come playoff time if they're winning games? 
If they're winning games 10 to 7, I would start yeah. worrying about it. Now, now, here's this. I didn't mean to quickly say, like, oh, Muzzin's hurt and, like, make it sound like I was, like, happy about that because that sucks. I think it was his second concussion in a pretty close time. He's now on LTIR, and, and that sucks. That's a guy they would need in their lineup to make a run for the Stanley Cup. But my question to you is, uh, first game after the trade deadline, are the two goalies for the Leafs still Morazic and Campbell? Because um, Biz, I don't know, it, man. No, 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 no. I, th- I think for sure. I think what they did, they, they got Carter Hutton as like kind of like an extra backup. Um, I mean, you know, he was playing in Arizona. I think it's pretty tough to gauge how the season went. I know he didn't have a good first game. I think he got lit up for like seven fucking goals on like five shots. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I just don't think that they have they have really the room to to do anything. And I think that you really, really fuck up the dynamic of that room if you do that. When I say he's well liked, the guys on the team love him. Like they're they feel for him right now to the point where when you have a goalie that you're kind of like you don't you know maybe you're not crazy about and you don't like the way that he handles the adversity. It's easy to not like the guy and not want to play in front of him. They're trying to fucking give him as many tucks as possible, and and and, and I'm sure that they're they're shooting him texts on the side, being like, "Hey, man, you're gonna turn this around." And we all know how much Jack Campbell cares too. I mean, if you ever listen to any of his pre- press conferences, so uh, short answer: yes, uh, both those guys will be their goaltenders. And let's not forget here, Mrazek's a pretty solid goaltender. Like, if 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 all things fail, like he's you know, you know, he he's a, he, every anybody could catch fire. Yeah, it feels like they they are showing cracks, or or I don't know if they just fallen because they started so hot. If you know, sort of a regression to the mean. But uh, since December first, the five on five save percentage for the Leafs goaltenders is thirty first in the league out of thirty two teams. Uh, Campbell's numbers are still good, uh, nine one seven save percentage. Mrazek down to eight nine four, and I, I think there might be some concern. Mrazek last year after Carolina, uh, he kind of had a little bit of a meltdown. And Campbell, you know, as great as he was, he had that one mistake which kind of uh, swung the whole series. So. I don't know, man. I think it might still be a question mark. And going back to Bunting's uh, call the trophy qualifications, you know he made the limit by two days because you you, uh, you can't have hit twenty your 26th birthday in that next season by September 15th. He was born September 17th, so he's Chip two in days, a chair, buddy. Two, hey, Chip no, I'm not knocking chair. him. I'm just I'm – just, I, I looked it up to make sure he was qualified. And it, it was it was two days within it, so – That would uh, make it even sweeter, and the, the public <laughs> outrage would get me going. So um, um, I also in in wrapping up our our, our Leafs talk slash bashing um, another little scary thing is I think it's twelve games without a Tavares goal he's playing around sixteen minutes a game not not a great look right now for the Leafs captain and 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 there's some question marks as good as the season's been I think Leafs haters and people who root against the Leafs like myself. They're starting to get a little bit of a wry smile, even as they continue to win. Because, I, I, uh, there's some this warts is, being shown. This is what I'll always say about Toronto and why I despise the the, the market and I, I support and love the team. Even more so now. It's almost like fueled my fire. Because if they win 10-7, it's a goaltending problem. If they win one nothing, it's an offensive problem. So it doesn't matter... If they're winning, they're bitching about anything. Like we're talking about, how about Tavares? Like he's had a great year. He's, I think he's over a point a game. Like maybe he's been fucking addition magician lately. I'm reaching. You know, I'm reaching. No shit, you are, buddy. He's fucking buzzing right now. He should have yeah. been in a goddamn all star. We know run and gun won't work in the playoffs, so we'll see what happens. We also want to wish best wishes to, uh, wishes to Jake Muzzin. Uh, he unfortunately suffered another concussion. He was placed on long term injury reserve, so uh, hopefully he. Feels better, gets back in the lineup. And also, they announced uh, Toronto did that there. 2020 first round pick, uh, Rodion Amerov. He's be- being treated for a brain tumor in Germany. Uh, he put out a message on Instagram thanking everybody for the support, saying he'll be back. And I mean, needless to say, we, we wish the kid the best. That's just awful news to hear. But he seems like he's in good spirits. He's getting help, uh, getting help with the, the tumor. So amazing positivity coming from him. Yes. And that's just a. I think he's in Germany right now, getting getting some work or treatment, whatever it is. But yeah, we're thinking of him. That's horrible news. Yeah, absolutely. Again, we, we wish him the best. But uh, moving on to a team that has been an, on an absolute fucking tear, a team nobody gave much uh, chance to at the beginning of the year. 85-1 to 1 Stanley Cup odds. Uh, the coach was 80-1 to 1 to win Jack Adams. We're talking about the L.A. Kings. Uh, five wins in a row, eight 1-1 one one in the last 10. They've vaulted into second place in the Pacific, three points behind Calgary. I know Calgary got a couple games in hand. Uh, but this team, man, they made a couple moves in the offseason, brought in Victor Arvidsson, 
Brought in Phil Deneau. Phil Deneau's already got a career high with 15 goals to go along with 15 assists. Imagine Stan Bowman traded this guy. He was Chicago's first round pick in 2011. Uh, they traded him in a second round uh, back uh, a few years back for Dale Weiss and Thomas Fleischman. Thomas Fleischman and Dale Weiss played a combined 34 games for the Hawks. They never re-signed with them. Fleischman ended up retiring. We signed elsewhere. Uh, Deneau had played 32 games with the Hawks. Just another brutal trade from Chicago, a guy who could have really helped them out. Uh, but either way, other guys, Adrian Kempe, 25 goals, leads the team. He's going to be RFA this summer, making $2 million now. Huge raise in line, uh, down the line, rather. Anze Kopita. Biz, you've seen this team quite a bit out west. I mean, what, what, what are they doing different? I know the goaltending wasn't great to stop the year. It's been stellar lately. Give us your take. They just got they, they, they got a good structure. They play, play, uh, they play their 6D. They're all pretty solid. Doughty's having a great year. Obviously, he was amped up coming in, basically calling out the team, saying, like, I ain't fucking missing playoffs again, guys. We're getting this thing done. And really, you mentioned that addition from Deneau. That has been so massive. I was... You know, I, I was a little nervous for them with that lack of offense with what they gave him, but maybe it was just a case of the fact that he had to lug the mail so much on the defensive side for the Montreal Canadiens that he didn't really have the energy. Now he gets to play below Kopitar where he's getting those easier line matchups because we all know what Kopitar can do from a 200-foot game standpoint. So their line in general has been buzzing. That uh, Trevor Moore kid, he's been a great surprise. Like, let's not forget here, like, drafting and developing has been one of their strong suits for a long, long time, LA Kings. Well, all of a sudden, they got good, and they weren't able to have high draft picks because they were giving them up to fucking win cups. Well, all of a sudden, you know, they had those few downturn years, and what have they done is they've they've filled up their stable. And, you know, I'm, ex- I'm excited to see with this byfield. Like, he's able to play in that third-line role, and he's not going to be exposed to, to you know to the, the more difficult competition. So he's able to ease into it. Just overall, all their moves have been great. And, and I don't know if you've uh, – I had to put my charger in there. Arvison looks great. You know, he was a guy who maybe dealt with some injuries in the past and you weren't sure what you, you as far as production and what you were going to get from them. But – I guess you just got to credit that front office and the moves that they've made, the players that they developed, and and the other uh, foot soldiers who have kind of came in the lineup. So, uh, I got a couple things about the Kings, and and Deno is probably the most important and the biggest reason I think things have changed. I know that may seem a little crazy, but it isn't just another big time center. And and granted, offensively, he's not not a top tier player, but the whole game and the whole package, what it creates is. A little break. So you said it's a little break for him. I almost think it's a it's a little bit of a break for Kopitar, where he doesn't always have to have the hardest defensive matchups. And because now you can put out Deneau when you're at home against the other team's best line, you can really trust that he's good defensively. And then he's got the 15 goals, so he's chipping in offensively with what he's making. You're loving his game. Doughty's returned to form. I don't know if he ever really left in terms of the team struggle. The Doughty still drew Doughty, one of the best to ever do it as a defenseman. He's an unreal player and a leader. I love how he was asking Clayton Keller's handicap when they were playing the other night. That was great. But you talk about the drafting and the developing, which is so important. But another big part of teams becoming really elite and getting uh, contributions from guys is the ability to sign an undrafted player. And it doesn't happen that often where you see a really guy, a guy lighting up college and he's undrafted and all of a sudden he's going to have his choice. Well, they got three guys. They got Ayafalo, undrafted. They signed him. He's a really solid player. They got that defenseman, um, Biz. You, did you play with him, um, Matt? Roy. Roy, right? Yeah, that's a, he's solid. That's a, Just that's solid. Un- Steady Eddie. He was drafted, but it was a seventh round pick. But still, that's a guy that they've developed three full years, pretty much, or two full years in the minors. And then there's one more guy. Who am I forgetting right now? Um, the Blake Lazotte, another undrafted player that LA's figured out how to sign and get him into the fo- get him into the organization, have him learn a little bit, and 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 that's the type of thing that really can kind of separate teams. If you're able to get, you know, I know that, like I said, Roy's drafted, but it was late. But then you get two other guys playing a pretty big role that weren't drafted. It's like that's great job by the scouts. That's a good job by signing guys who any team could have had. So I, I think seeing quick, and I, I would say they're pretty much fifty fifty in starts. Right? Is it? it it's quick and uh, Peters. I- I got it right here. Uh, Quick has 30 starts. Peterson has 22. And like I said, if you look at the numbers, okay. they don't jump out at you. But I think I, uh, that's indicative of the bad start they had. It's kind of the opposite of Toronto. And, you know, Toronto's save percentage has kind of come down where L.A., their, their goaltenders have, have played a lot better. Uh, it really it don't matter what, who they're starting, Peterson or Quick. Yep. Uh, the, the Kings are, are playing outstanding right now. 
And my yeah. last thing on them is I, I, I don't think they're really going to go anywhere. I'm not 100% sure they get in the playoffs. There's a lot of hockey to be played, but they get Edler back, I think, mid to end of March, right? That's kind of like a... That's almost a, that's a that's a that's a trade deadline move. Just getting him healthy again. He was playing solid hockey. I think he broke his ankle. So yeah, I I, I think I think it's no surprise um, because you look at or it is a surprise because of what everyone thought before the season. But the guys they have there and the success they've had with that core, I, I think they're going to be right there and probably get into the playoffs and be a tough out for anyone. Yeah, and the I fact so, that man. and the fact that Kempe has pretty much joined that core. And sometimes it comes down to patience too, right? Like I played with him in the AHL and, you know, there was uh he came in and he lit it up when he was 18 when we ended up winning that Calder Cup, not a big deal. Um, but then there was like a little bit of regression in the minors when we moved over to Ontario. And then when he finally got up there, you know, he still, you know, wasn't having that impact. Sometimes he would disappear for a few games, but this year, man, he's finally came out of his shell and he's figured it out. And, you know, sometimes uh, teams give up on these guys at a young age. Yeah, like I said, his 25 goals lead the team, and uh, I'm rooting for them, man. I have an 85-1 to 1 ticket on the Kings I put in at the beginning of the year for the Ooh, Stanley Cup. You know, this I, I like is, to... Hey, guys, this is the time of year when we get... RA's got futures on 24 of the 32 teams, so everyone <laughs> I don't here, need one, I baby. got a 60-1 to 1 ticket on them. He bets everyone, guys, so don't let him fool you. Uh, I bet the long shots, baby, because you, you, hit, you hit one with it pays for the last 20 years, so that's all I'm hoping for, baby. Uh, keeping with the theme of teams on the West Coast, on the Pacific, Thursday night we had some serious uh, uniform porn when the Calgary Flames visited the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, the Canucks, they dusted off those old funky black jerseys with the skate on them from the 80s and 90s. And Thatcher Demko, man, he had an awesome tribute to Kirk McLean. Of course, he was a legendary goaltender for the franchise. Uh, we've seen a, some awesome goalie, uh, what do they call them, kits, setups, whatever, uh, this year. Dude, his might have been the best, the black pads. And I send you guys the picture. He made a save that looked exactly like McLean, like the legs were spread the same, the glove up in the air. And he even said Demko, I don't really make saves like that. I don't know where that came from. It was almost like McLean was kind of getting into his body or something that night. Uh, Biz, also you mentioned Michael Buble was in the house and – uh, Chase Claypool, uh, wide receiver. He, I guess he's from the area. He got on the mic, said the Flames oh, sucked, yeah. got the crowd going. So kind of a lame chirp. Let's roll it, G. This is a bit weak. Oh, he's a lame ass dude, buddy. He remember the fucking <laughs> move he did that cost the Steelers that game. When uh, he I was like we, celebrating think... his first down, and they got like a delay a game over it or something. You remember that goon? <laughs> Claypool, fuck off. I don't even. I don't even like the Flames, and I'm like, who's this guy chirping the Flames? Uh-oh. I'm with Chase Claypool. We put up a touchdown, baby. 7 nothing is a touchdown score. And I just want to say the Calgary Flames suck so bad. Right, yeah, there you go. I mean, it's supporting the team, I guess. Maybe he had a couple cocktails in the booth. But uh, also, we're going to get a shout out to uh, Elias Pettersson, uh, alumni of the Chicklet Show. Since January 16th, uh, he had 11 goals on 30 shots. I know that's an unsustainable shooting percentage, but he's a different player under Bruce as well. I know he struggled getting out of the gate. Uh, the Canucks all, also ended the Flames' winning streak at 10 and became the first team in NHL history uh, to face an opponent on a 10-plus game winning streak and beat them by 6-plus goals. And prior to Pedersen's goal Thursday, the Flames hadn't trailed at any point for nearly six hours of game time. Pretty impressive streak. Calgary's still getting it done. And Biz, I know you were um, more impressed by Johnny Hockey's salad. I know it was it was out for warm ups and then they ended up getting dusted, so it kind of got lost in the shuffle of all the goals and them getting fucking speed bag. But uh, yeah, man, I, I thought uh, I thought it looked pretty funny on there. And Sonny really Milano might be giving him a run for his money too. Sonny Milano got some you know, Caesar salad, Cobb salad, all kinds of stuff going. But either way, we just talked about Thatcher Demko. It's probably a great time to get to him. Fantastic interview with one of the great, brilliant young stars of the NHL. But first, we want to let you know that this interview is brought to you by Mattress Firm. America has a problem. Everyone is exhausted and out of it because they're not sleeping in a bed that's right for them, and the sleep they're getting sucks. And this problem has a name. It's called junk sleep. Unjunk your sleep at Mattress Firm's President's Day Sale from now until March 8th. Fix that stuff. Save up to $500 when you get a king bed for the price of a queen or a queen for the price of a twin. Stop by one of their many locations with bed starting at just $159.99 with immediate delivery. Or you can save $300 when you shop Tempur-Pedic at America's number one Tempur-Pedic retailer. I told you guys, I needed a new bed recently. No BS here. I went to my local mattress firm over in Dorchester. They hooked it up. The service was awesome. I got the bed in a couple days. There was absolutely no problems whatsoever. So if you're in the market for a new bed, new mattress, by all means, check them out. I can attest to it myself. So to unjunk your sleep, go to mattressfirm.com or a mattress firm store today near you. 
can speak with a sleep expert to unjunk your sleep. And now we're going to go to Thatcher Demko. All right, well, we'd like to bring on our next guest. This goalie from San Diego was Vancouver's second-round pick in the 2014 draft, and he had three stellar seasons at Boston College before turning pro. He since worked his way up to become the Canucks' number one goalie and recently participated in his first NHL All-Star game. He's also the first goalie from California to be chosen as an NHL All-Star, thanks to his many highlight reel saves. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. That's your Demko. How you doing, brother? Good, guys. I'm uh, excited to, to get on the show with you. Great to have you. you. guys had a wild one in San Jose last night, right in the thick of the wild car race. Looks like you guys are having a lot more fun out there than the, than the beginning of the year, huh? Yeah, I mean, things kind of got off on the wrong foot, and you guys know when you're you're not winning, it's uh, it's a pain in the ass. It's uh, no fun going to the rink, and uh, I think we just need a little fresh of uh, or a breath of fresh air. And uh, you know, since the coaching change, things have been kind of turned around for us, which has been huge. So, uh, still got some work to do here down the stretch. I think we got like 31, 32 games left, and uh, they're all going to be important for us. So, hopefully, we can make a, a pretty solid push. Where, Give me your honest opinion. What did you think about Bruce? There it is, because I was all over that thing. That was one yeah, of the worst yeah. chants of all time. I um, I think like the first time it was kind of funny. You know, we were kind of hot there for a second, and um, you know, then the fans just started kind of overusing it a little bit. You know, we'd like score a goal in the first period. There's like ten minutes left in the first, and fans are like acting like we just won the game or something, or you know, whatever it was. I mean, it, it's fun. You know, gets the fans into the game or whatever, but. Uh, yeah, I know he, he's not a big fan of it. And, you know, our team kind of uses an inside joke. We're always sending around the meme of you, you know, doing the, the goofy boost. <laughs> there it is. They're just pissing guys off or whatever. So, I don't know. It's it's fun, but it's, uh, you know, it is what it is. Is he still dropping a million F-bombs for pregame speeches? Yeah, I think uh, I think sometimes he gets stuck in what he's trying to say. So, he just kind of fills in the gap of, uh, you know, <laughs> just filling in the, the quiet areas with a couple F-bombs here and there. But, uh he, he's a funny guy, man. He's uh he's definitely a one of a kind coach. Someone I've, I, he's a guy I've, I've never really met anyone like him. So uh, it's been a, a treat getting to know him. That's me on the podcast when the brain isn't clicking. That's when you know that, that the F-bombs are coming in more and yeah, more exactly. often. Now, uh, do you guys give it to him about being on Cameo, which is pretty uncommon for a uh, Is he really? Oh, yeah. And it's yeah, cheap. Ooh, it's like 38 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Canadian. No, it's a, it's and he's affordable. making two sheets. Yeah, no, we, um, I don't think we know him well enough yet to, to bring it up, but we've definitely passed around a couple. Um, <laughs> I can't, I can't remember who it was, but I think someone on the team had a, a friend or a family member kind of got pickled one night and ended up ordering one from him. And, um, <laughs> he, he came through the next day, like on a game day or something. So, uh, we were kind of testing him to see if he was still on there, but yeah, he's, he's pretty active on there. It's pretty funny. They gotta, they gotta get these on the jumbotron in between periods to keep fans in their seats and boozing and having a good time and, and entertained, oh, fuck, obviously. Yeah. yeah he is. Hey, uh, hey, Biz, people, people ask him to put like a little barbecue shirt on, on a barbecue sauce <laughs> on his shirt, but he's like, Oh no, it's already there. I don't even need to do that. Oh yeah, yeah. Makeup. Uh, that's <laughs> unbelievable. That is a, uh, in any funny instances at uh, pregame meal, we've heard a couple stories in the past. Yeah. I, I saw you had Spurge on uh, a little bit ago and he's talking about the, the hand, the uh, hands in the ice cream. There, we had uh, we had a couple of guys that had played on mini when that had happened, so we heard that story. And um, I don't know. I mean, like you guys mentioned, he's, he's walking around with some some couple stains on the shirt or or what have you. He's, he's hitting up the hotel bars and mini bars, you know, grabbing some snacks and stuff like that. But um, yeah, he he's he's a treat. Everyone's always kind of laughing, and um, he's keeping things light. So he he's hilarious, man. You guys are 15, six and four since he took over. What was the biggest change he made when he came in? Um, I, I think it was just preaching the the team aspect and, um, you know, really coming together as a group. And I think we, you know, when things aren't going well, it was, it was a situation where a lot of guys were trying to solve it on their own. And, um, you know, that's never going to work, especially in this league. Everyone's such a good player, but you, you, you need to have a, a solid team. Um, you know, working together and everyone on the same page. So I think that was something that guys kind of banded together with and, you know, paid dividends pretty much right away. Other than him, who else keeps the room, the room light? Um, I would say JT Miller's a guy who's always, uh, he's chatting and uh, making jokes and he doesn't shut up very often, but um, I think it's, it's for the better. Um, him and uh, Garland are, 
always giving oh, it to each my other. Goodness. Fuck yeah. Garland, <laughs> Garland's a, a treat. I didn't realize how funny that guy was until the guys in the locker room yeah. started telling me because he keeps it pretty serious and and uh, and stoic on the ice. But uh, that's unbelievable. Yeah, he's a little rat on the ice for sure. But you know, behind the the, the closed doors on the bus on the plane, he's always cracking jokes and. Um, yeah, I mean, those guys together are pretty funny. And we have a couple other guys, you know, Bo and, and Tanner Pearson, Tyler Myers, guys like that. that um, you know, they've been around and um, good spirits in there. So uh, it's been fun, you know, especially when you start winning, everything seems a little bit easier too. Yeah, the losing is just so difficult. And then in the Canadian market as the number one goalie, there must be times at the, at the beginning part of the year where you're like, oh, my God, I just need to get some wins to loosen everyone up a little bit. No wonder Marky left. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it sucks at times, man. I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, everyone, you know, I'm from San Diego. I, I didn't know what Hockey Night in Canada was until I, you know, got drafted and, and signed pro. So um, everyone tells you, you know, the Canadian market's tough, but you don't really feel it until, um, you know, when Marky signed and I was kind of put in that position to, to get an opportunity to be the number one guy. And, you know, I'm getting DMs telling, telling me I, they hope my dog gets run over by a car. Oh. Like, I hope you're... I hope your mom gets cancer. Like I've seen just some fucking wild things where I'm like, you know, I, I, there's been times where I've just, you know, put the phone away for a long time. I think last year, even I, I deleted my Instagram just cause it was, you know, we were brutal last year too. And um, so it was just, there's, there's been times where it's like, God, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty tough sometimes, but uh, I don't know. I'm definitely learning how to manage it a lot better and um, you know, making it easier on myself. Is that something that Marky helped with? like easing you into that i feel like you guys had a, like a really really good uh like tandem relationship even to the point i think recently he commented on one of your 50 safe performances about yeah. one upping them so you guys still yeah. kind of keep in touch and i imagine he helped along the way yeah i mean marky has been he was in the organization from the, the day i signed so um he was always a guy i looked up to and um you know seeing his progression not only as a player but as a person too like you know he, he was in florida there for a while and you know, guys weren't really sure if he was going to make it. And he, he really made a choice to, you know, to, to mature quite a bit. And um, you guys all see what he's become now. So he, he was a guy I definitely looked up to and, and learned a lot from and kind of took me under his wing, you know, when I first got called up and I kind of got to watch what it was like for him from a distance. You know, I wasn't quite in the spotlight yet, but um, you know, just, he, he helped, he helped me a lot, a lot for sure. I obviously don't know a ton about goaltending, but having played with him and, and kind of seen him on the ice, would you describe him almost as a little bit of a natural, like the way he moves is so fluid and he's so big that you're, you're shocked. He's that coordinated and that smooth being that size. Like, is that how you describe his game a little bit? Just kind of born with it. Yeah. I mean, he, um, he was a guy that was like just all natural, you know, early in his career. And I think once he came to Vancouver and, you know, we brought Ian Clark in and, Clark, he kind of gave his game a little bit of structure. It was just scary. You know, like he, he had that combination of, you know, the, the structure and the technique and then mixed in with that like natural ability that he kind of grew up with. And, you know, he, when, when we were partners, like watching him play every night, there was just times where I was like, Holy, like, how did this guy do it, man? Like, it's like, I could never see myself doing that, you know, like some of the things he would do. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it was awesome to see him kind of grow up and, and go through that process. And obviously he's having tons of success in Calgary this year. God, you mentioned, I mentioned you from San Diego. You moved to LA as a young kid. Did you play goalie right away from the start? Or did you have a play out for us then go into goalie? How did that all transpire? Yeah. So I, um, I always just like was drawn to playing goalie. Um, obviously, you know, like when you're a kid, you always like rotate or whatever it is. So, um, you know, I was always asking every week if I could play again. And um, I think I was like 10 years old when uh, I stuck with it full time. I, kind of regret it sometimes now <laughs> might be a little bit easier to play winger some nights just when people tell you know. you hope they hope your dog dies you're like oh, i wish i was a fourth line winger <laughs> yeah i'm like fuck, i could soak a few and get the fuck out if i needed to but um yeah i mean it, it was something that i was just drawn to right away for whatever reason um i want to ask you a little trivia there's been three goalies born in california that have played in the national hockey league uh you and you know the two others no, John Blue is one of them. Yeah. Um, I I don't think I know the other one to be honest. I think it's pronounced Colin Delia. So there's not there's. Oh one, yeah, I, yeah, Colin. Yeah, he, we're around the same age. I think he's like that's stupid of me. I should have known that. Suck yeah, on that think, one, Colin. <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> that's yeah, I guess me. 
Yeah. But uh, I was surprised to see that there were only 10 current NHLers born in the state of California. Like, was it was it hard to find good development? Like, how did you get so good with maybe like a lack of that in, in, in California? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, like I wasn't very good growing up. Um, I was always playing double A. Um, I tried to play up uh, with the birth years ahead of me, you know, the 93s and 94s. Um, even if it was at the double A level, I just felt like being around the older guys might help me out. Um, you know, I wasn't really making the triple A teams. I was trying to move away relatively early. I think when I was like 12, I, I went up to Toronto and um, there's a, a school called Peak or something. Um, you know, I tried out for the Vaughn Kings. I tried out for the Toronto Marlies, all those guys, and, you know, didn't get called back. I tried going to Shattuck a couple times, didn't make those teams. Um, and um, RA mentioned, like, I, I went to L.A., and that was kind of like my last resort. Like, I, I called teams in Colorado. Oh. I looked at prep schools out Damn. east, you know, Gunnery and, um, you know, Victory Honda in Detroit, Honey Bake, all those teams, and just – I. I never really got the call back, so I ended up just going to LA, and things just kind of fell into place. To be honest, did that put yeah, a because, chip on your? I was just gonna ask, did that put a chip on your shoulder? All that rejection, like do you have, or, or are you just? Uh, maybe a little bit. I I just for me, like for whatever reason, I just had it in my head that it was gonna work out. Like I, I don't know what what it was. Like I just knew that um, you know I'd get an opportunity at some point. I just have to make the most of it and. Um, you know, I think like a month into me being in LA, something went uh, weird in Omaha where they had two starting goalies and they had to trade one and they called me and they're like, Hey, do you want to finish the year here? Like, you're going to be our backup, but if you want to come up, you can. I was like, I was 15 at the time. I was like, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Um, and things just kind of rolled from there. I was going to ask because to get all that rejection and then to move, all right, go to LA. Like I wondered not too long after that, you're making the national development program. So Maybe it was Omaha. Maybe it was it was even L.A. at the beginning before you went there. But there must have been a jump and there must have been a moment. You're like, holy shit. I'm like, I'm feeling like I'm really improving at a rapid pace. Is, is that the case? Yeah. So, like, I think, you know, I I tried out for because I didn't play both years at the development team. Um, I got cut my first year. Um, I was kind of in the mix. I didn't get invited to 40 man camp or any of those goalie camps where they were making picks. But I heard my name kind of around. And, you know, I, I didn't get drafted into the dub. I didn't get drafted in the USHL. So I was like, holy man, like, I guess I'll just, you know, go to LA. And the Omaha thing really just fell in my lap. Like, I was so shocked, you know, like I didn't get drafted. I didn't get protected. Out of that. And I was just like, hey, I'll play here. And then I'll go to a couple camps, you know, next summer and see what happens. And, you know, that year in Omaha, like I, I that was when I kind of like, you know, really got my name out there. And, you know, I played pretty well. I, you know, I didn't play a ton. I had Alex Lyon was my uh, goalie partner. He's a stud at Yale. He's playing in the American League now, I think, in Chicago this year. But um, that was the year where it was like, okay, like this is my chance. Like I got to, you know, take advantage of this. And, you know, I went from there to the U.S. team. And then, you know, I accelerated my um, senior year high school and I went into BC a year early. So everything kind of happened really quick once that first call came. Is, is, is it true that your parents did not want you going to the USHL at first? Um, my mom was a little worried about it. Um, my dad was, you know, my dad was a guy that obviously my mom was super in the mix with the hockey stuff, but she was more, you know, trying to develop me as a person. And my dad was, you know, the, the hockey development side of things, I guess you could say. Um, so I, I had to make a decision like the day they called, like, so I, I called my mom right away. I was like, Hey, just let you know, like I'm moving to Omaha tomorrow. And she was like, what the fuck do you mean? Like, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> and I'm going to become like, a farmer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's tons of corn out there. Um, so she, she was just like, we need to talk about this later. I was like, there is no later. Like I'm packing up, like I'm, I'm on the next flight in the, in the morning. So um, I was like, you can come out and visit me and um, you know, a couple of weeks and, you know, see what it's all about. But um, that's where I'm going to be tomorrow. So <laughs> Were you at that time, were you already six, four? Had you grown at a younger age and then you kind of grew into your body or was there a late growth spurt? No, I was six, four. I can felt like when I was 10, I, I was always kind of long and lanky. Um, and that was kind of the reason I wasn't too sharp as a kid, yeah. um, you know, growing up and I was just real awkward in the net, you know, it didn't move well. I, I had a little bit of the, the compete, the natural battle, like that kind of stuff. But you know, there's no goalie coaching really in San Diego. Um, you know, I would, anytime I went to a tournament somewhere, my dad would kind of look up what the, the best goalie coach in that city was. And I would get some goalie coaching um, in between games or, 
um, you know, just to kind of see what it was like. I mean, there's not a ton of stuff going on in San Diego back when I was growing up. So um, it was kind of tougher to find, you know, the, the right path in, in that sense. Hey, you get any coaches that had like these wacky devices and shit, kind of like golfers oh, yeah, have? Dude. <laughs> dude, but yeah. And of course, like, you know, my dad was super invested into it. You know, he's, he's doing whatever he could to get me, you know, to the next step. And he would take home everything that ever, any goalie coach, the, the guy could barely tie his skates in some cities. And, <laughs> you know, he's got all these like strings attached to my helmet. He's like using like the white puck, the, 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 tin cup. Puck, the mini pucks. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I'd get, I'd get home and like right in the mail, like my dad ordered it online. I'm fucking sitting at home in the living room with my bucket on, like got strings going. Like it was just, you know, just doing wacky stuff, just trying to figure it out, you know? Now, Dad, didn't you actually drop out of high school and enroll in like an independent study program so you can get more ice time? Yeah, that was, um, that sucked, man. I'll be honest. It was fucking brutal. It was my freshman year of high school. Um, I was trying to make the development team. And I think, you know, we, I, I played on, uh, I was the backup on our 16 AAA team uh, that year in San Diego. And we only practiced Tuesday, Thursdays, and then we'd play on the weekend. But, you know, I was playing maybe once a weekend and, you know, getting two practices. in. so I was like, that's not enough if I'm going to try and make the, the U.S. team. So, uh, I dropped out of public school and I went to an independent study uh, program up by the rink. And so I would go to school in the morning from like eight to 10. I'd get on like the public bus, go to the rink and skate for a couple hours with like the beer league guys, you know, like the stick times or whatever, get back on the bus and go back to, to school and then, you know, go back on the bus and go back to the rink for Holy practice. Shit. Um, so it was just like, you know, especially as a, a young, you know, freshman in high school, I was, you know, kind of right in those, those adolescent years. And I spent a lot of days just kind of by myself on the bus or at the rink and um, just trying to get some extra ice time. And, um, you know, and then I, I went to the tryout and got, got cut. So, or I didn't even get called for the tryout. So I was like, oh, <laughs> it kind of sucks, but um, yeah, I mean, it was just part of the process in San Diego. Like I was just desperate to to do anything I could to, to figure out a way to get out of there. So any, any, any crazy stories from riding public transit? Oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> don't get our ray going in yeah, California. There's some, there's some creepy, uh, creepy dudes on the bus, man. That's for sure. I had a, I had a guy freaking come up to me and he was just like, he, he was asking me to like, go get it, like get off the bus and like go behind this building. Cause he had like something to show me. And I was like, oh, what yeah. are you talking about? Like, I don't, I don't think you got anything to show me. He's like, no man, like it's awesome. I was like, oh, the oh, yeah, dick. Now, I'm, now I'm told <laughs> like, that's all you had to say. But Barry. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it was just like, I, I felt so awkward on the bus. I just had my headphones in and kind of kept to myself. There's some, some creepy dudes out there it's for like sure. That, it's like that text you open, you, you know, emergency and you open and it's Barry with this huge, <laughs> yeah, just, this massive right horn behind the, <laughs> come check it out behind the shed over here. Um, yeah. I want to ask you, I'll go off the grid here. Uh, you're a big uh, NFT guy. I understand. Yeah, a little bit. My my dad is uh he, he used to work for Upper Deck uh, when I was growing up, so he um he started a little NFT line for me this year. He's trying to kind of blend the ideas between the physical card and the NFT. Um, and so we we put together a little something with all the proceeds going to the Vancouver Children's Hospital here. Um, and so that that kind of kicked off right before the season started. That's awesome. Does that kind of derive? I know you're a big video game guy too. So are you, uh, you kind of in all the Bitcoin and all this crazy internet movement? I, I couldn't be farther from it, to be honest. Um, I don't really get it. Uh, it might sound, sound naive, but uh, yeah, I'm so far away from that stuff. I, I, I got my real money or <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> oh, I got geez. my paper Gosh. money and my, my credit cards. And that's good enough for me, but um yeah i mean it's crazy my, my dad was trying to explain it we were going through the process of, of launching that whole line and i mean i spent uh, a lot of time on the phone with him and and the guys that were kind of putting it all together and it was kind of just still going over my head so that's awesome well that's a good hey. thing you're doing uh, ra wasn't a big bitcoin guy until he found out you could launder money through it so now he's all in the crypto <laughs> pulling up my spot because the feds are listening <laughs> yeah <laughs> Hey, you think you think the Canucks fans can be bad? These NFT people, you just called it not real money. You might get some oh. serious action on your Instagram. Oh, yeah, the Bitcoin mafia. Um, <laughs> when you got to the U.S. program, like being a late bloomer and all of a sudden being there, even though a year and a half before that you're in you're in L.A. Were there a bunch of offers from schools? Because you end up going to one of the top schools in the country. Pains me to say in Boston College, but did you have options, or was that kind of like one of the only ones? 
No, I, I definitely had some looks after that U.S. year. Um, that really just opened the door for me. Um, you know, I was getting talked about for the draft and, you know, I, I was a, I'm a late birthday, so I had another year. Um, you know, a lot of my teammates were getting drafted out of the program, but I had another year, um, you know, before I was supposed to go to college. So um, I, I visited a ton of schools. I really wanted to go to Cornell and Denver. And um, I was actually, so I was supposed to meet with the Cornell coach. We were playing them um, one night uh, when I was with the U.S. program. And they were like, hey, like, come stop by the office, like, after the game. And so I went to the office. I guess I went to the wrong office. And I got back on the bus. I, like, called my dad. I'm like, hey, I couldn't find him. Like, you know, I'll call him tomorrow or whatever. And the next day they offered a kid. And they were like, hey, he didn't show up for the meeting. So we gave it to someone else. And I was like, <laughs> just a miscommunication like went to the wrong door or whatever it was but I was like oh, it kind of sucks but um yeah so I, I ended up visiting Denver too and they wanted me to go back to the USHL for two more years which I wasn't a huge fan of at the time um you know I just played a bunch of college teams that year with the program so uh, I felt like I was kind of ready to to get in there quick and then BC said hey we'll take you a year early and I was like all right let's do it Wow, a lot of twists and turns in your career already, and, and it, is. Uh, it was wild. Yeah, and and the one thing I was going to bring up is probably maybe the biggest adversity you faced in your entire career. You ended up having to get double hip surgery, yeah, while you were in college, and basically completely reinventing your style of goaltending while in the process of healing through this the, the hip surgeries. Yeah, so I I had hip problems from the time I got to Omaha. Uh, I knew I was going to need some surgery at some point. Um, so I got through the, my draft year, my freshman year of uh, college, and you know I was I was in some pain. I was debating whether I wanted to get it done, but I didn't want to get hip surgery right before the draft. It felt like that kind of fucked me. So um, I was like, you know, I'll just wait. I'll play another year, and then my sophomore year was just terrible. Like I was, you know, having a hard time, like you know, walking around after games, and you know, I was getting golf cart rides back to the dorm because I just couldn't get back, and. Um, you know, I ended up, you know, I think it was like two days after our season ended that year, I ended up getting both of my hips done. And luckily the process went pretty quick. I think I was back on the ice in like three months and, um, you know, lucky enough, I didn't miss any games and I uh, got off to a really good start my junior year, which, uh, which was nice. Well, the numbers your sophomore year were good though. I mean, that's pretty impressive to be in that much pain and, and you played pretty well. Yeah, I, I it was okay. I mean, I, I felt like, um, I could have had a better year um yeah you know college I feel like in college like it, it's it's uh it's pretty normal for a guy um you know a goalie to have a good year you know you look at a lot of the guys that are coming out of college like they're coming out with just crazy numbers I feel like the numbers save percentage is going up and goals against is going down um so you know I, I had some some giants in in hockey East those years you know I was trying to keep up with like Hellebuck and John Gillies was really good for Providence um, you know, uh, that, that O'Connor from BU was having some great years too, uh, the year that they went to the Natty championship and, um, yes. you know, so I, I know, <laughs> hate to bring it up, but, um, you know, it, it, it seemed like on paper, it looked like a good year, but for me, it just didn't really feel like it. So I had, I felt like I had a lot to prove going into my junior year. So a lot of guys, they go to the national program. And I think later on, like myself included, it's like, I think that really was an important step for me. And it's maybe one of the reasons I was drafted high or made the NHL. You learn how to kind of be a pro at a young age, but you have a more memorable story. I talked to Mike Ayers, who was your goalie coach at USA and at BC. He was my high school teammate, an amazing college goaltender at UNH. He told me, um, interestingly enough, that's where you met your fiance, right? Yeah, we um we met at one of the USA camps when we were like I think 15. Um we were we just stayed good friends. We didn't really hit it. I mean, we kind of hit it off, you know, as, as friends at the time, but she was she was dating Mike uh, Babcock Jr. when I met her. Um <laughs> which is funny. She was I, I he was coaching the Wings and they were at the same high school together, so I was trying to, you know, wheel her a little bit and she shut me down pretty quick, which, you know, looking back was a good thing, but um, yeah, we just stayed close friends and, um, you know, in sophomore year of college, we ended up starting dating. So we always say that Mike Ayers kind of got us together. <laughs> Did she play at BC as well? No, she actually uh, ended up going to NODAC. Um, she played okay. there, uh, same time with like Brock Besser and, uh, Troy Stetcher. Um, so they were there kind of all at the same time. Wonder You're like you Brock. Know. You never met my girlfriend, did you? I'm like, please tell me you don't know who this is. 
Now, what's this uh, dancing Demko I, I heard about? I couldn't find any clips online. What, what, what did you used to do? A little jig on the ice? They told you to knock it off. What was that all about? He worked at Brandy's in Vancouver. No, this is uh, dancing Demko has been retired for a while. He, um, it was just when I was in college. It was something that I used to do uh, just to kind of keep myself, you know, in a good frame of mind during the game. I used to be pretty hard on myself. Um, you know, so the dancing thing, you know, during uh, the in between whistles or whatever, you know, they play tunes and, you know, just dancing kind of kept it light for me. And I was actually at the combine and, um, you know, I, I go to meet in with uh, Colorado and Patty was there at the time. And um, he fucking laid into me for this dancing Demko thing, man. He no was, way. And, it, you know, like it's one of those situ- uh, situations where you kind of go in, you're like, Patty Waugh, man, like I grew up idolizing this guy. Like, I can't wait to see what this guy's like. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth, he goes, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I was like, God, this is not going how I was <laughs> hoping it would go. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I'm just, you know, a young, scared kid. And he's like, I see you out there fucking dancing around. Like, you don't give a shit. He's like, how are we supposed to draft you? Like, you know, it, it seems like you're out there just having a good time. Like, we need a guy that's like willing to do whatever it takes to win. And like, just go like laying into me. And I was just like, from that day forward, I was like, you know, I, like, you know, to a certain extent, he's right. You know, in college, you can kind of get away with it. But, you know, if you see a guy fucking out in the national, like dancing around during, in between whistles, like it's not the best. Flower kind of does. Yeah. Yeah. But that's flower. He yeah, true. He's, he's going to the Hall of Fame. Well, I mean, he, it, it, he was doing it in junior, too. He always had the smile. You could see the chickles yeah. from the top bowl for, for crying out loud. Uh as far as uh, as far as Patty Waugh's concerned, he's got to hit the fucking Stevie Weiser, Iserman uh, kind of program at uh, at these fucking combines. Yeah, like why'd you bring me in to interview me if you hate me that much, Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I, it was just a, as a kid, I was just I didn't really understand what I was walking into, but yeah, it was just kind of a bummer having having the meeting go that way. Well, a lot of kids. Um... Ayers, he always also mentioned to me, like, you know, a lot of kids, people think maybe they got their athleticism from their father, but he tells me your mother and your aunt were unbelievable high level volleyball players. So they were, they were pretty athletic yeah. themselves, huh? Yeah. Studs, man. Um, still are, honestly. I they mean, still my, play? My dad, um, oh, not as much as they'd like to. Um, but I mean, my dad was an athlete. He played rugby in, uh, in college at Arizona. He ended up breaking his back. So he had to, hang them up. But, um, yeah, my mom played at the university of Florida and then transferred to San Diego state, uh, volleyball. And then my aunt was an all American at USC. Um, she ended up playing pro in Chicago for a bit. And, um, you know, they, they're friends with all the volleyball legends and, you know, the people that kind of, you know, reinvented the sport back in those days. And, uh, my mom actually ended up coaching college for a, a good amount of time when I was growing up. So I was just kind of always around it. And, um, you know, it's it's definitely something that was fun growing up just to be around a different sport and, you know, just, you know, kind of developing that athleticism, I guess, a little bit. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're studs. They're, it's competitive, man. Whatever we're doing as a family, like, they still kind of got that fire in them, which is uh, it's pretty funny. Where uh, where are you boys hanging out in Vancouver? Like, where are you, is, is the Roxy even still a thing right now? Do you guys still go there? Uh, the Roxy, uh, not too much, to be honest. Um I think, I think like the, the organization kind of has tried to steer guys away from the Roxy a little bit or at least oh, yeah? like, I think, I think it was my second. Not enough Z packs floating around for the guys. <laughs> yeah. We're, sh- we're short on Z packs right now, but <laughs> I, I think it was like my, my second development camp. I, I came in and I was hurt for my hip surgery. And so the, the team had to work out the next day and there was like three or four of the injured guys that the, the team knew that we didn't have to work out the next day. And they could kind of feel we were probably going to go out on the town or whatever. And, I remember Stan Schmiel called me aside and he's like, Hey, like, whatever you do, do not go to the Roxy. <laughs> <laughs> and like, of course, the second bar we go to is the fucking Roxy, like both our feet in for the night. And hey, that's we a Demp goes back, baby. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, they get a comeback uh, for sure. Uh, uh, what's your and, move uh, on the dance floor? What do you got for us? I like to drop it low, man. For sure. I got the new hips. <laughs> he <laughs> learned it on like the b- uh, public transportation in LA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right that's right oh, but, you got the pop uh, yeah. it lock at hips you got oh, the yeah dude once once i get a couple cocktails i mean you get a good baseline there i'm 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 fine to dance for it real quick <laughs> that's on that's unreal what was that what was your favorite things about living in boston for three years it was just it was so different from what i was used to and um 
you know, it was such an awesome city to, to go to school and with all the, the schools kind of right there, you know, you're running into BU and Northeastern Harvard at the bars out, out at dinners, like things like that. It's, it's so cool. You know, I, I grew up in San Diego and then I was in Omaha and then Ann Arbor. And then, you know, it was kind of like my first time out East experiencing that whole thing. And, um, it's definitely a different type of people out there for sure. And, um, you know, it, it kind of makes you a little bit more well-rounded just being around, uh, you know, the, the preppy, preppy kids out East. And, um, it was cool. You know, I, my first year I had, I had Kevin Hayes and, you know, Jimmy was around a little bit in the locker room, um, here and there when he could be. And, um, you know, those are some, some big time Boston guys and just kind of looking up to them as a, as a young kid and kind of seeing, you know, the, the type of people that Boston can produce was pretty awesome. Well, your freshman year, you saw one of the greatest college hockey performances of all time in, in Johnny Hockey. Like, you must have just been blown away because the best part is everyone knows this is no secret. He'll go out and get after it. And then the next game, he still gets four points after being just waffled. Yeah, I mean, that was that was the biggest eye-opening thing for me. Like, I was 17. Like, I I had just started drinking, like, figuring it out, you know. And, um, you know, here I come into college and I got Kev and Johnny and Billy Arnold leading the charge on a Thursday night, like, you know, just fucking mangled. And then I'm like, these guys are going to suck today. Like we're going to get, you know, pumped. And then they have five points each. And I'm just like, all right, I got to figure this shit out. Cause that looked really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think we can agree on music taste. Your two, two of your favorite artists, uh, Led Zeppelin and also rapper J Cole. Have you ever been yeah. to a, a live show of J Cole's? No, it's bucket list for sure. Um, He's, he's definitely a guy I, I like a lot. Um, I'm a big hip hop guy. So, I, I mean, I grew up on, you know, the classic rock stuff. My dad got me into uh, Led Zeppelin, you know, Leonard Skinner, those those type of guys. So I got a, a pretty wide uh, variety of, of music taste. But J. Cole's definitely up there for me. So I, I definitely want to see him live one time. Fuji's. <clears throat> yeah. What's your go-to Zepp album? Uh, tough one, I know. That's tough for me. It's uh. I kind of like their, their slower stuff sometimes, you know, like Stairway to Heaven's obviously a classic. Um, all of my love, like those type of songs for me, like obviously you can get the headbangers going, but uh, I like when they kind of slow it down a little bit. Yeah, Stairway to Heaven is still the most awkward dance song at a school dance because at the beginning you slow dance what and then all of a sudden you're grinding her ass. Stairway to Heaven at a school dance. Buddy, I was in eighth grade in 1993, I think. Like, buddy, this was still a big time song back then. Yeah, eighth grade that was... now we're listening to Lil Nas Wayne X. I, it's a fucking joke. <laughs> I think that's probably one of the teachers slipping the DJ a $5 bill saying, hey, give me a little Led Zeppelin action. Keep, keep, keep me awake from babysitting. One of the chaperones, biz? Yeah, well, yeah, leave yeah. room for the spirit. Um, I was going to ask you about your mask. You got the zombie on it as the, the, the Mr. Canuck. Is the yeah. a big zombie guy? No, not really. Um, I just, I, I like to keep it somewhat original. Um, you know, and you get into the you know vancouver everyone's got the mountains with the sea and you know they got the same look kind of across the board with goalie mass over the last you know 20 years or whatever so i was trying to figure out a way to you know you kind of run out of options so i i felt like the, the zombie twist on johnny canuck there might be kind of cool and something that um is unique so um my dad and i kind of came up with it and uh, i've thrown them on the last handful of masks so it's kind of turned into johnny zombie Look like an East Hastings guy with a Canucks jersey on come out of the fucking. <laughs> yeah, that's the other way to put it, I guess. <laughs> we, after we, that after that junior year at BC, just looking back, I mean, it's hard with those numbers. You completely dominated, but was it like, oh, I want to stay for my senior year? Or it's just like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to take you know my game to the next level. And with that, did you know there would be a little AHL time for you? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to win at school so bad. And, um, you know, that, that decision was really tough. To, I'll be honest. I spent a lot of time on the phone with Erzy. Um, and I mean, he, he, he's in kind of in a tough spot, you know, it's, that's his job. He, he wants to be competitive. He, he in a way wanted me to stay, but at the end of the day, his message was kind of like, Hey man, like you've, you've done everything that you can do at the college level. Like might be time for you to go. Um, and I definitely knew that I was going to be, uh, spending some time in the AHL. Um, you know, the transition was actually a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, um, you know, just kind of being a naive kid. But 
Um, so it took me, you know, I, I think I was down there for like two and a half years. Um, so it was definitely, uh, it took me a bit of time to kind of get acclimated, but, uh, yeah, it was a tough decision to leave for sure. Um, Jim Benning was the guy who drafted you yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like handling you through the whole process of like getting the surgery on the hips and even like the way you came up through the American uh, hockey league, like obviously he just got fired, but I guess the handling with you, you guys probably had a great relationship. Yeah. I mean, Jim was, uh, he, he was business first guy for sure. Um, you know, there's, I think there's different personalities around the league. Um, I didn't talk to Jim too, too much. Uh, it was definitely, you know, maybe once a summer. Um, but you know, obviously he was in the loop with the hip stuff, like you mentioned, and you know, he, he did a great job handling my decision to, to sign and, you know, he didn't pressure me or anything. I know there's a lot of pressure on organizations with, you know, guys like Hazy, I remember, you know, he stayed for his four years and then ended up, you know, becoming a free agent and um, ended up going to, to New York. So I, I know it, he was probably a little bit nervous about me doing that. So um, I thought he, he handled that with a ton of uh, respect for me and my family and, and gave us some time to make the decision, which was awesome. And, you know, I think, you know, as much as you don't want to be in the American League, I think it was necessary for me. I think I needed the time. And, um, you know, he definitely didn't rush me in, in that regard either. So. Um, yeah, I mean, credit to him. He, he definitely had a, an eye out for me. Just as a quick follow-up, like, was there a, a point in time where you were chomping at the bit where you're like, I want to get called up now? Is that, is, is that kind of why you mentioned that he, he kept you down there to kind of marinate for two and a half years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think through my first two years, I only played one game. Um, and it was a, a weird one. Like, I was showing up to the rink for a game in Utica, and – there was a car waiting for me to take me to the airport in Syracuse. And I was in the car, you know, my flight was at like seven o'clock. So I didn't get to Vancouver until like 3 a.m. And right when I landed, I got a text. They're like, Hey, you're playing tomorrow games at one. And I was like, Holy fuck. Yo, right, shit, sweet, sandwich. That sounds good. Yeah. So um, the game, you know, we ended up winning whatever, but I just, I was getting itchy. Like I, I wanted to see if I could take that next step. You know, you're always at least wanting the opportunity and, um, you know, I, I wasn't a guy that was, you know, pissed off about it or anything, but you know, you're a competitive guy. You want to get up and see what you can do. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I, I went into camp the next year and got sent down again. So I was like, all right, like, I just got to go down and, and, you know, do what I can. And, you know, next time I get called up, like we got to roll with this thing. So. so. So I know you mentioned being in the AHL can be a good thing, which I agree. And, you know, you could play in Austin or now there's a team in San Diego and no offense to the wonderful people at Utica, but that place is horrific. Now I got to <laughs> ask you, you dealt with a robbery there. No, as he said, I got to get this out of you. You got robbed there. Yeah, dude, I got robbed at gunpoint um, <gasps> in my own crib. Fucking it was, insane. Uh, dude, crazy. This is like my, my go-to story. I've told it so many times, but it was, um, it was actually after the gold medal game of world juniors. I think it was the year that U.S. beat Canada in a shootout. Um, I think Parsons was in that that year or something. But I was living with Jordan Subban at the time. And, you know, Subi had gone to bed um, around like 10, 30, 11 o'clock or whatever. So I, I was a couple hours behind him. and I was just dozing off in the back door and our, um, our house didn't lock. So I, I heard the back door open and I was like, you know, <laughs> Subi, you know, we had banter back and forth as roommates in my head. I'm like, what the fuck is Subi doing? Like, I'm trying to fall asleep, like whatever. And then I hear like wet shoes on the hardwood floor. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. Like, you know, maybe Sue getting something or so I called him and I could hear him in his room, like across the hall. And then I could also hear like noises out in the living room. So I was like, I don't know, like you always hear shit in your house and you, you'd go out and check and there's nothing there. So I just like got out of bed. I was in my boxers and I'm like walking down the hall and this, this dude like turns the cord and he's got like all this shit in his arms. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing? And he's like, I'm taking your shit. And I was like, oh, God god damn like you need a hand or something like he was just so confident like it definitely wasn't his first time doing it take the um, toaster yeah seriously so i, I don't touch I, my playstation though oh yeah dude, that's all he took man i was rattled like he, that's he only ended up taking the xboxes but yeah i like followed him out into the snow and i was just like still in my boxers i like, put my hand on him i was like hey man like if you just give us the stuff back like i won't call anyone like no harm no foul whatever and you know, he kind of switched the stuff over into his other arm and like pulled the gun on me. And oh, I was like, shit. Hey man, go ahead. Like, it's all good. All you. Yeah, and yeah. Um, you forgot the NFL blitz. Yeah. <laughs> seriously. 
<laughs> so I, Tony Hawk, um, Gator. Yep. What else you want? Here's my wallet. Yeah, anything, man. Um, so he got in the car and they started driving away. I like ran inside and grabbed my phone and I like chased after him and I took a couple pictures of the license plate. Actually, I still got them on my phone. Um, and so like when the cops showed up, I just showed them the, the plate numbers and they found the guy in like 10 minutes. We found him, um, Mike Babcock Jr. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was like, yeah, I think his name was Mike. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we ended up, like, going to the police station. We had a game the next day. I remember I called because Greener was my coach at the time. And I called Greener at, like, 4 in the morning. I'm like, hey, I just got fucking robbed. Like, I'm in the police station. Like, this is crazy. I just wanted to let you know. He's like, all right, I'll see you for morning skate. I was like, fuck. <laughs> I was oh, like, oh, like, maybe trying to get out of the morning skate. Um, like green you ever so, had a glock to your temple buddy fuck can yeah, i get a day yeah. off <laughs> yeah so it, it was a, it was a wild experience man i got lucky i mean it, it was kind of stupid chasing after him you know in hindsight but you know you always watch these movies and you're like fuck like if i got robbed i'd just beat the shit out of the guy but when it actually happens it's kind of like i froze man i was like i don't know what the fuck to do you so, gotta watch those yeah, internet shit, videos man. of that guy what is it in detroit <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Now he's>, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that's right <laughs> Hey, the craziest part of that an ambulance, is, but not for me. Yeah. <laughs> the craziest part of that story to me is that you lived in Utica and you couldn't lock your back door. Like, come on. <laughs> well, yeah. So we were bitching at our landlord like the whole the whole year. Really, we were like, "Hey, like this fucking door doesn't lock." Like, and she's like, she was the sweetest woman. She was like ninety five. Um, she went to church like three times a week. She's like, yeah, yeah, I'll check it out. I'm like, all right. Like, you know, you can't really lay into her. You know, she's too nice. So, but the funny thing actually was it, it ended up being her son who set us up to get robbed. Get so, the fuck dude, out yeah, of cause, here. Because it was so set up. Like the guy had a van like waiting. So they were like going to swipe the whole house. Because we were, we played the next night and then we were supposed to go on the road. And so I guess this guy got, this is what the uh, DA ended up telling us. He was like, the guy kind of got caught up in this, like, you know, drug predicament where he couldn't pay this guy. And he was like, Hey, these guys are going on the road. Like they're not going to be there. He mixed up the date by, he was one day off. He's like, the door doesn't lock. Like you can go swipe the whole house and like, we'll call it even. And so, um, it was just, yeah, it was just Jeez. fucking wild. Man. The sticky bandits. Wow. Yeah, the, the, the mutton cuts. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. Is that the dumb and dumber mutton cuts or whatever? Yeah, the mutton cuts. <laughs> yeah, so, they, yeah, the guy just messed up the date by one day and, you know, ended up, I think he got 10 years. Like, we had to go on trial and everything. Like, I had to testify in oh, front of shit. him. I had to, I had to go in front of the jury, do the PlayStation. Thing, so. It's nerve wracking, isn't it? Testifying, huh? Dude, it was actually Wicked worse bad. than the robbery, honestly. No like, shit. Yeah, I mean, like, you're going in and, like, I don't know, you don't want to, like, be a rat or anything you know like i don't know you it's tough like you know calling a guy out right in front of him but like they make they made me like stand up and like point at him like physically point out and be like this is the guy that yeah, like whatever six nine up. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking putting guys away you gotta get you gotta get the six nine tattoo now right up here yeah right yeah hey yeah. you're hey you're big with the halloween costumes you should go as him next year I don't know, man. That's, uh, I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure the Canucks fans will be okay with that. I'm sure they won't sure. fucking have the check mark brigade going nuts. Oh, they would be going nuts for sure. Uh, yeah, were you a big Willy Wonka fan as a kid? Biz just mentioned the Halloween costume. You dressed up as an Oompa Loompa, and I'm assuming that was your, your your girl who was dressed as Willy Wonka in that picture. Yeah, that, that was Lux. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a movie I always uh, grew up watching with my grandma. Um, you know, the Gene Wilder version oh, is, yeah. is way better than the only version than the Johnny Depp version. So, um, yeah, my grandma passed away. She was always a big, big movie gal. So um, some of those older movies kind of stick with me a little bit. And uh, Lex and I were kind of chatting about what we wanted to go as. And, you know, we ended up doing that. It turned out pretty good. Nice. I, uh, I, I want to ask, excuse me, Biz, about yeah, your first goalie partner when you went pro, Richard Bachman. Was he still yeah. wearing those Stephen King masks even all those years later? I know he did when he was with Dallas. Was, was no. he still doing it all, the, all that time later? No. No, he, he's kind of off of that stuff. But I remember seeing that, you know, he was a guy, you know, I obviously was a little bit younger when he was coming up and playing uh, for Dallas. And, um, you know, as, as a guy I watched, so I, I definitely you know, remember him watching, and, watching him in those. But uh, when we were together, um you know he wasn't too too into it but he he's a fucking great guy he, he was awesome to me he's you know a big reason that i was able to to you know kind of transition into the ahl and um you know continue developing for sure 
So I, you, I see, like, looking at it now, I mean, your numbers, they get better every single year, no matter what level you're at. So I imagine you don't even consider yourself, you know, near a finished product yet. You could consider yeah. there's a lot more left to learn and, and improve at? Yeah, I mean, I I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. Um, nice. You know, I, I felt like, you know, I, I was a backup to Marky, and then last year I was – kind of like the a1 a b or one one a one b type of thing with holtz um and just like such a you know fucked up year um you know it was so hard to i was dealing like we were all as a league just dealing with so much stuff other than hockey it was like so not about the development last year i felt like it was just trying to keep your head above water and um you know obviously i learned a ton through it you know playing through a bunch of shit and uh, figuring that all out but I felt like this year was a, the first year I came to camp like all right like I'm the guy um, you know I'm I'm gonna take over and you know I, I still think there's a ton to to improve on you know I'm I still think that you know there's been times this year where um, you know I, I you know get off the ice after the game like fuck like I can be better for sure so uh, just keep working and you know take it year by year. That's the bubble sort of your coming out party. You had that stellar showing versus Vegas, two and one, nine, eight, four, save percentage uh, shutout. You were the first start three games in a row. I know it was only three games, but that, did it feel like something changed when you, when you had those appearances or was it just kind of business as usual at that point? Um, I mean, going into the game, it didn't feel different. Um, you know, I, I, I felt nervous as shit. <laughs> I mean, I, I hadn't played a game since the shutdown. Um, so my, my last game was March 10th and, you know, fast forward like three months or whatever it was. And, you know, we're down three, one and they're like, all right, like, let's go. And I was just like, Jesus Christ. Like, I don't, I don't even know how to handle this situation. I was like, you know, I, I kind of had that like, fuck it, like whatever mindset going into the, the first game. And, um, you know, we ended up winning that game. I can't remember the score, but you know, after that I was, I was like, Hey, like I can't be a one-off. Like I, I got to do it again. You know, I, I don't want to just be like, oh, you had one good game and then he shit the bed. Like, I got to do it again. And then, you know, we end up winning the, the game six there. Um, and then I was like, fuck, I got to do it again. You know, I, I don't want it to be just two games. I was, so I kind of just kept rolling. And unfortunately, we, we didn't get it done in game seven. But um, I think it definitely kind of – it made the decision hard for the organization. You know, Mark, he was going into free agency. Um, had I not played those three games, who knows what the situation might look like yeah. right now. Um, you know, and it's crazy, you know, like, like I said, when I was, you know, talking about being a kid and just waiting for that one opportunity and taking advantage of it, like, it's as simple as that. And, you know, I got lucky with an opportunity and, you know, you know, I, I, I took the most of it. So it all, I mean, it all goes back to the shit sandwich that Benning dude. gave you. It all goes back <laughs> yeah. to the, to the fucking, the car service from Syracuse shit sandwich special. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's almost similar in a way, like. Vancouver got lucky that you were able to kind of show them how good you were. Whereas Florida, they hadn't really seen Spencer Knight yet. And they give this monster deal to Bobrovsky. And now it's kind of like, even though he's been great this year, it's tough. Markstrom might've got a huge deal from Vancouver. And then it would have been like, Oh, we got this young stud. So lucky for them, you were able to show yourself and kind of light it up those three games. It probably changed the course of the organization in a way. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I feel like this, this game is just all about opportunity and, you know, it's, it's so unpredictable with how things are going to play out. So uh, it's definitely, you know, the nickname bubble Demko is getting a little old for me, but um, you know, it's definitely a huge, huge point in my career for sure. And with, I mean, talking about the goalie situation, I think they kind of dealt with it with Luongo and Schneider. They already, uh, they already yeah. fumble fucked that one a little bit. <laughs> well, two really good goalies. It's tough yeah. to, yeah. tough to handle. Exactly. Um, anything else, RA? Like that's, I mean, this has been awesome, dude. Yeah. This has been awesome. No man. offense, but the bet one of the best stories is you getting robbed at gunpoint. Dude, it's, <laughs> it's, it's all time, man. It's all time. Uh, I, I want to go back to uh, Kirk McLean. You were recently sporting the old retro gear, the uh, Canucks yeah. skate logo from the '80s. I guess you guys are going to wear those jerseys soon. Uh, where did that idea come from? And also, that was your your back the back plate on your mask too. You had the the clip from the painting from him from the '94 series, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, again, just trying to be unique. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big history guy. You know, I, I love to pay homage to to guys that have come before me. And I have a, a huge respect for that type of thing. Um, you know, I always take take pride in that kind of stuff and, and paying my respects. So I figure, you know, what's what's the best way I could do that with the, the skate jersey? And 
Um, so I went on Google and, you know, I did the, the 1994 cup run, you know, when they ended up losing to, to New York there. And, um, you know, it's, it's literally a head to toe, um, replica set. So the stick, the, the pads, gloves, helmet, everything. Um, and then, yeah, I got the picture of him and Lyndon uh, on the back plate, which is a cool little touch too. Now, um, you know, before we let you go, I see you got some, um, some mug shots of some artwork there. Who, who is that yeah. besides Frank Sinatra you got up there? That's, uh, so we got, uh, the bottom guy there is Elvis. Um, and you got Jimi Hendrix, uh, Sinatra, and then Pac there on the top. Nice. Nice. I love yeah. that. So a wide range of, uh, kind of hit every, every genre there. Biz will have a mug shot at some point. You can frame that one. Hey, <laughs> come on. Wait, yeah, don't be saying that. Next up. Um, next up. I, you mentioned you're a big hip hop fan. Have you seen the new Kanye documentary? Yeah, I saw the first Epi. Um, I watched it pretty much right when it came out. So I'm, uh, Looking forward to the next couple that are going to be released here. Yeah, pretty. That pretty, guy's crazy, uh, man. I I know it's I awesome. His fucking mind. <laughs> I'm I'm obsessed. I'm dialed in. All right, we're going to talk plenty about it next podcast. So oh, be yeah, love it. I love it. I got to get you catch up. Well, Thatcher, uh, such a humble guy. We really appreciate you coming on. It's awesome to see the success a, a California goalie that's lighting it up. And and we really appreciate you taking the time to join the show. You got fans here now uh, for the rest of your career. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. A blast. Our pleasure. Right. Keep killing it, brother. All right. See you guys. Man, big thanks to Dacha. A great kid. We enjoyed the hell out of talking to that. That story about his time in Utica, absolutely bananas. Uh, just some good stuff. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. We do want to let you know that his interview is also brought to you by our friends at Roman Swipes. Guys, you know the drill by now. Thinking about weird shit doesn't always stop you from arriving at your destination on the rack. It happens to all of us. Not a big deal. But the folks at Roman, an online men's health company, are changing the game with Roman Swipes, the secret to longer-lasting sex. Roman Swipes are a clinically proven way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and fast-acting. And the best part, they don't require a prescription. Roman can ship swipes to you in discreet, unmarked packaging, and each swipes packet is small enough to hide in your wallet for whenever you need it, hopefully tonight. They're super easy to use. You know, you just take the swipes out of the packet, you swipe it on, you let it dry, and you're good to good to good to go. That's it. So go to GetRoman.com slash chicklets to get your first month of swipes for just $5 when you choose a monthly plan. That's GetRoman.com slash chicklets. All right, moving right along. A little bit of trade chatter. Uh, uh, per our pal Andy Strickland, uh, Nashville is, quote-unquote, actively shopping Philip Forsberg. Uh, his rep said they were very surprised by the report. Uh, there have been preliminary talks with the Preds about an extension. Uh, he's a 24-year-old forward. He's going to be UFA this, st- UFA this summer, and he's making $6 million now. He's definitely going to get a raise, uh, 44 points in 38 games thus far. Uh, Preds currently the number one wild card team, so trading him would be a big deal. Whit, I know you want to chime in on this. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I think it's kind of crazy, and I believe Andy Strickland. He's a well-informed reporter. He knows what he's talking about. But if it is true, I don't agree with it. And it's only because like Nashville's shown this season – that, that they are a good team. I don't, I don't necessarily think they're a Stanley Cup contender, but like we've said a million times in the show, you never know once you get in. And, and with, with Saros in that, then you really don't know. I mean, he's one of the top goalies in the league. So unless you get this ridiculous return, which probably is not going to happen, being a UFA and a possible rental, I don't know how you trade your best player or you know best forward. Yossi's their best player. And, and what does it say to the entire team? Like, wow, we've had a season like this where not much was expected and this is what we're doing and all of a sudden Forsberg's gone. So if he's going to you and, and saying there's no chance I'm re-signing, that is a little different. And then maybe you have to look at getting some sort of asset, if not assets, for, for, for you know when he does leave. Um, that's one thing. But if you can get him talking and what, what, what they've made clear is that he's not going to make more than Yossi which I believe so it was at nine, five a year, right around then. So if he wants more than that, maybe he could get it, but it seems like he loves playing there and I don't know him. So maybe I shouldn't say that, but I know the guys all love him there. And, and for me, it's hard as a fan of the Predators or a player in that team. If the season they've had where they're getting momentum, they're trying to get into this race, all of a sudden their best forward's gone. I, I, I don't agree with that. And you could almost look at it like they were trading for a possible rental if you keep them. Do you know what I mean by that? Where it's like, all right, well, we're bringing this guy in. And, and if, that, that wasn't, you know, if that's not the case that he wasn't already here, all right, well, we're bringing a guy in to try to get over the hump and make a run at the cup. So I, I don't know how you trade him unless it's an enormous return. 
Yeah, I agree with you on the fact that you, you're basically kind of telling everyone, hey, we're looking towards the future here. But if you're so far off on your number and, and you know, you just want to trickle it out there to maybe some teams that would overpay and you can get a, a, a good prospect who you think is going to make an impact in the NHL and maybe a first round draft pick. I mean, yeah, like it's it's a hard it's a hard part of it being a GM, right? You also have to worry about the future. You want sustainable success, and you don't want to just roll it where if he genuinely doesn't think this is the team and 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 he he thinks they're close, especially with some of the guys they got coming up. Like they got a pretty good wave of young young guys coming up. So um, I don't know. I don't know what what do you think he makes on the open market though? He nine he probably, million. He could some team maybe give him ten. I mean, it sounds I, crazy, I think but what, this I think guy... Where, I think where Poyle screwed himself was when he paid Duchesne and when he paid Johansson. Yeah. Like, you're just like... like They're having great seasons, and they're playing up to what they're being paid right now, but I think that that those those two you could chalk up as an overpayment where if you even wanted to consider keeping Forsberg, if you're not as close as you originally thought, you've kind of washed it out the tube. You can't, especially a team like that, you can't invest so much in so few guys. I don't think they have what it would take to get him, but imagine him on the Bruins. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Get your hand out there. of your pants, all right? Yeah, sure. it was already there. Uh, yeah, Johansson, he's making $8 million a year for the next three years after this year. Uh, Duchesne making the same $8 million for the next four years after this. And, of course, Yossi making over nine for, geez, I don't know, the next several years after this. So well. the reason... So- the reason I threw the nine number out um, was because, like, as as a guy who's been there longer, you're probably like, hey, I'm outperforming and I have these two guys. Like, uh, there's no way I'm taking any less than eight. So yeah. he's just like, he's probably at a, a an astronomical, astronomical number that for, for us, but I think you'll probably end up getting it. Uh, what you mentioned, UC Saros. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him uh the other night in Nashville, it was great. I got to hang with the Tampa guys. I said at uh, Tootsie's, and then I went to the Tin Roof. Me and Uppy took a cab over there, uh, hung out with all the Preds guys, and someone said, oh, UC's here, and I, I, I got to meet him. That's the only guy I took a picture with all weekend because I, I was fanboying a little, and I got to chat with him a little bit. Uh, just a super guy, man. Like, we chatted for a, a few minutes, and I really am really impressed with him. Got to, you know, basically tell him how much I appreciate his game. So it was pretty cool, man, pretty cool moment. I was, yeah, I was a fanboy. I'm not going to lie. It was good stuff. Uh, there's also been speculation about Patrick Laine and Brock Bessa, uh, of course, and uh, Emily, Kaplan, Emily Kaplan from ESPN. She said there's been no meaningful offers brought to the table as far as uh, Patrick Laine, but Columbus and them will talk this summer. Uh, she also said the Canucks regarding Bessa, they don't want to trade him. They're kind of dangling his name out there to see if they get maybe a godfather offer, you know, an offer they can't refuse. And he's going to be due for a big raise as well. And the Habs are also looking uh, for at least a first round if uh, any deal for Ben Sherratt. So a lot of trade chatter out there. We still got till March 21st. I'm sure things will happen by then. But Do you know Laine's eighth in the league in goals since he came into the NHL? <laughs> so it's as as much as he gets dogged occasionally for defensive play, it's like that guy can score, and the run he's on right now is wild. I don't think they can trade him. But That's how it make- goes. I know. Remember the one year he had like 27 goals in fucking six games? <laughs> And then and then he went cold for twenty five. He goes on these. He's like fucking Merle's at the craps table. He just like goes, he goes dry, and all of a sudden you're just like two hour and thirty minute roll. Let's go. You know you're fucking buying. You know putting a mortgage down on a house because of it. Yeah, he's a holy shit. Does he get hot? And his pregame outfits, man. They've been a lot of yeah. chatter online about. It. I know we've been cheering him too. It's uh, he's got a unique a, a unique style, and it's pretty funny. We like we love to see these guys showing their personality. Uh, a few other player notes here. Uh, Islanders, Dano Chara, future Hall of Famer. He passed Chris Chelios for the most games played by an NHL defenseman uh, when he played in his 1,652nd game Thursday in San Jose. I thought it was really cool. The Sharks honored him on the Jumbotron. They had a clip from Patrick Marlowe, you know, praising Chara. It was just, you know, pretty cool to see a, 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 the opposition give him a little uh, dap him up like that. He also had a scrap as well in that game with uh, Jeffrey Viel, and he became the oldest fighter in NHL history as well, at least the oldest play to get a fighting major uh his 77th regular season fight and he gave him a little nice pat in the head after so congrats big z keep getting it done out there uh and his teammate zach parise in the same game scored his 400th goal uh the 10th active guy to do so and the fifth from that famous 03 draft uh eric Stahl, joe pavelski jeff carter and Corey perry uh, have also done the same uh edmonton forward Derek ryan notched his first hat trick of his career saturday at 35 years old 
becoming the eighth oldest player to do so in league history. Nick Lidstrom, uh, of course, did it the oldest at 40 years old and a defenseman to boot. Uh, let's see, rattling right along here. Boston's Brad Marchand, my boy, said he's not going to appeal the NHL upholding the six-game suspension. I know he had already served it, but this is more about getting, I, I would say, money back, right, Biz? If you're appealing, it's more about getting your dough back. Uh, and Brad said, I think I'm just going to move past it. It is what is it? it is what it is at this point. I miss being around the guys. I miss being part of the group. He did return to action Thursday night. Uh, also, uh, we want to congratulate the Marchands on the birth of their baby daughter this week, so... Congrats to Brad. And I, I gave a little tweet. He, uh, he was patting R- Rima uh, on the back. I was like, oh, this is what the media doesn't want you to show. <laughs> clearly a troll. Clearly a joke. Cause oh, it was some on people media. didn't like it. Dude, it's hilarious. Like, it's what used to be a place you can joke 10 years ago and people got it. Now it's like either people don't get it or, or they try to correct you. It's like people are a little wound up. Clearly, it, like, I get it was a, a I, joke. I have a snap show every now and then on there. I used to snap a lot more. but I've, uh, I've had some like written out response tweets and I'm like, Oh, don't send that. And then Twitter's like, like, are you sure you want to threaten this it. person? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, I said, me, what the are you media sure doesn't you want to say 14 F bombs in this tweet, <laughs> sir? Utilizing three different forms of media, but saying the media don't want you to see it. Like, that's the joke. Like, in fact, it just fucking seals over everybody's head. But uh, once again, congrats to the Bosch. You know my game. <laughs> oh, we got that little later coming to you. Uh, we got to talk about uh, you, your boy, uh, Sandbagger uh, participant, Cole Caulfield. Absolutely on fire since Marty St. Louis took over. Uh, six goals, four assists in the first seven games under Marty St. Louis. He had just eight points in 30 games under uh, Dom Duchamp. They put him on a line with Nick Suzuki and Josh Anderson. Uh, they won five straight, and they've combined for 19 points. Uh, Marty St. Louis said, I can see this line being together for a long time. It's like, yeah, the, the combinations they have out there right now. You know, Canadians, the season's probably lost, but they're building for the future. What, have you seen them play much at all? I know the Canadians probably aren't number one in your radar. No, no, I haven't, but I'm really happy for them. And it just shows that the ups and downs of professional hockey, it doesn't matter how long you play or how short you've been in the league, they're always there. It doesn't matter if you're Sidney Crosby or a young rookie. It, it, there's times when it's really hard. You're, you're, you're struggling a little bit. You're squeezing the stick tight, and you can maybe have a coach. And I don't know the relationship between Ca- Caulfield and Ducharme, but – Maybe the trust wasn't necessarily there. And obviously the ice time, I, I, I don't think that it was what Caulfield had hoped for. And you get a new coach in, and not only is it a new coach, it's a guy you probably idolized as a player, an undersized forward who went on to be a Hall of Famer, who no doubt had a talk with Caulfield about how much he believed in him. And, and now you just see, you're just you seeing what's going on with a little belief for a player. And, and there's not anything that's changed. His skating stride hasn't changed. His release is still the same. It's mental. It's, it's, it's your mind and in terms of looking at situations a different way while also getting a chance to play on a better line. So Suzuki and Caulfield's games have both exploded since, since uh, St. Louis takes over. And the problem is if you're a Canadiens fan, you really want that first overall pick. It's almost like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, hold on. I, I, lo- I love Caulfield scoring. I you love better the break up play. that fucking line. Yeah, yeah. We don't Louis. want them winning the five fuck in you a doing? row. Break up that <laughs> line, man. <laughs> we don't want five Hock wins in dirt. a row. So, uh, but I'm happy for him because you know before the season the expectations were sky high and 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 that team's just been such a it's been such a struggle this year that now you're looking for at least positivity for certain players and I think Caulfield's proven not only to the fans and to the coaching staff with St. Louis but himself. Like, all right. I am still the player I know I was and know I am, and I'm going to be able to score at this level where maybe some people question that. St. Louis like, dude, this season's over. Go out there and get your fucking cookies, buddy. I'd be hanging out with that fucking far blue line all night, brother. Get over <laughs> there. Fuck the rest of these guys, man. Get your Skrilla, dog. One for the little guys, man. Come on. <laughs> oh, shit. Fuck these uh, big motherfuckers back here with those long legs, man. You get your bread. Uh, a couple injuries to, to note here. Uh, Carolina defenseman Tony D'Angelo, like I said before, has been a huge part of that D. Uh, they haven't missed Dougie all that much uh, after signing him. He's going to be out for at least a month because of a, a midsection injury. Uh, his 40 points, a third on the team, 16 power play points, and uh, plus 19 lead the team. Uh, the team did recall Jalen Chatfield from AHL Chicago. Uh, Vegas goalie Robin Leonard and forward Nolan Patrick were both placed on IR. Uh, the Lena injury doesn't seem to be too serious. He should be back soon. Obviously, we mentioned Patrick before. We wish him the best. Hopefully, he can get back out there soon. In Pittsburgh, defensive Mike Matheson, he's out indefinitely with an upper body injury. Mike Sullivan said it's going to be week to week. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that's the guys RA injury there. report. All right, yeah. what's bugging you? What's oh, bugging you? Oh, no, What's we got to bu- say we say we're saving grab my gears for the et cetera. Stuff. Well, I so, no, I, I didn't mean like oh. uh, like you mentally. I meant physically. Oh. Like it's the RA injury report. Oh, you, got any, um, you got any bumps and bruises from the trip? Sore nostril. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was one, only one night in, only one night in now a white oh, credit okay, card you're good yeah no you're no feeling I'm, I'm feeling i'm feeling good i like i said I, if anything my heart rate's up because the two cups of coffee i was i was you know a little tired from the trip just one night i had a late night at the tin roof not not buckled just having fun hanging out with the preds and whatnot yeah, um, not buckled, oh, you didn't sure. mention my injury, my fucking knees. I had to get Paul Pierce out of there in the in the studio last night. I had Gretz pushing pushing me out of there after my river dance. Yeah, no, I'm I'm feeling feeling good, feeling good. What were you uh, gonna say, Wit? I had nothing. nothing. I, 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 my body feels horrible, but I'm. Oh, you, I think I know what you were gonna say. That. You know, you're going to say, I'd imagine the ice bags that would be on Barnaby's knees if this uh, ECHL thing goes down. What the hell is happening? Well, nothing anymore. Oh, okay. All right, all right. we're going to jump up to that. Yeah, this. this I don't is, know. Uh, Did you guys want to do it now? We, we can. Yeah, I think sure. we need a little excitement right no, now. I, all right. No, absolutely. Yeah, I, I had labeled this comeback kids in our outline, but apparently it's all for naught. You know, um, our buddy Merles, of course, he came back. He started a little comeback in Sweden, dusted off the skates, got back out there. It was looking good. And I don't know if that made other guys scratch the itch, but all of a sudden, Sean Avery decided he wanted to play again. He reached out to the Orlando Solo Bears, and then. It started this like sort of Twitter ripple effect. All of a sudden, Matthew Bonaby chimes in. If Avery signs in Toronto, I'll sign with any anyone in that division. You can play me as much as Torts did. He said, he seems like he's really itching to get back at Avery. Uh, the Jacksonville Iceman replied, uh, "They're thinking about it with a little emoji." And then uh, Bonaby said, "I'm very excited for what might the might few uh, the next few days might bring with the East Coast." Then Big George Larock chimes in. I want. I want to make a wish. Can a team in the EHL sign me for at least one game against Sean Avery? These guys are lining up to punch Avery's head in the coast. Yeah. Uh, but then it was a big sock at the end of the day. It felt like a wrestling thing. Uh, you know, like there was a big work. Uh, but then all of a sudden, Orlando released Avery on Friday. Uh, Avery went on Instagram. He said he was missing his kid too much. He wanted to go home. He thanked Orlando for the opportunity. He skated with him for a couple of days. So what looked like it might be an absolute circus in the coast turned into a, a big. Wah, wah, wah. Well, I mean, I don't think it was Merles who sparked him. I think he'd been talking about it for a while. Like, he's pretty active. And, I mean, when you retire, you get a little bored sometimes, you know. You're, you're sitting around. Maybe sometimes the roles aren't coming. Avery got moves a... the needle. I'll say that. The guy goes back to the coast for three days, and there's 50 people lining up to try to play against, to fight him. It's like, that guy gets people talking. That's what he does. Oh, my God. Would that have been a treat? And now, I think, R.A., when you were describing it, you said, sign in Toronto. I'll sign somewhere else. You meant to say Orlando. Uh, the, okay, yeah. The, uh, my brain, I, like honestly, I don't even know I said that. My, you know, sometimes listen. I read, the Leafs are on Toronto. everybody's mind, buddy. Like I don't blame <laughs> you. They're a fucking wagon Maybe, right now. Unless Bunting I'm is going them. to actually. You know what? <laughs> Bunting is going to lap those fucking guys. With I'm going to oh, go back shit. on my statement. I'm going to stick with what originally came out of my mouth. Just like, hey, here's another one for you. I think Austin Matthews should be considered for the Selkie as well. If you watch his defensive game, hey. He commands the ice just as much as Kopitar would. Kopitar got one, and he was able to put up 100 points the year, year he won it. So Matthews for Norris. <laughs> While we're at it. I'm and Campbell, off, you, given the recent dip, still has a chance to pass Igor Shosturkin for the best goalie in the <laughs> NHL. Hey, how about him right now? He is freaking humming, man. He's going to win the Vesna. Yeah, he might win the fucking MVP, too, the way he's playing. He has yeah. a save percentage that I think only has been matched by Jacques Plant in the history of the right, NHL. Yeah. <laughs> Not, <laughs> nine for one if he should hold, yeah. Which which, which, if I'm a Rangers fan, I'd be very nervous. It's, yeah, you have this world-class goalie, but I don't know. Like it's, it's, it's almost like Lundqvist in the way where they had this the best goalie in the world, and then like other than that, it's like without them, is the team as good as their, as their points and their record show? I don't know. Yeah, just twenty two goals allowed in his last sorry, just twenty two goals allowed in his last thirteen starts, and only Carolina has allowed uh, fewer goals than the Rangers thus far. Interesting. Yeah, uh, we were just talking about guys banged up, and I, I don't know. Right now, it's been a tough week for the officials, man. Um, last Monday, I was at the Avalanche Bruins game, and Nate Dog, our buddy, uh, he was not disciplined. He inadvertently whacked the linesman with a stick after faceoff. He was going to hit Thomas Noshik. I guess he apologized to the lineman shortly after. And people think he got a break because the league is supposed to have a, a zero tolerance policy. I guess the official said it was an accident. Uh, that was apparently enough for the NHL, not even a fine. I mean, and listen, I'm not saying he should have been fined, but you know, when you have a zero tolerance policy and a guy, even by accident, whacks, whacks a ref, uh, should anything happen there or what, Biz? So some media members are saying he's like getting out of, out of hand, like with some of his antics. He's just a really intense kid. In this case, He's 100% trying to whack the centerman who got him with his butt end. 
he just so happens to hit the ref like it's so it, obvious when you it's, watch it, it. it it's so obvious from the overhead because you could tell how quickly he goes out and extends it i mean like it seemed like a bit of a love tap so i think this is a big fat fucking nothing burger okay. and if you guys you know, no but but if you have a, a different opinion ra like do you, do you agree that he was going for the other guy no, absolutely. And like I said, I'm not advocating he should be it. Just that, you know, when, when you say a zero tolerance policy, that, that's zero tolerance and it shouldn't be – Whether, in other words, that implies if it's an accident, you should still get a fine. Oh, okay. You know, I, that, that's I all. thought just, that that would mean on just like if there was genuine intention. Yeah, like, I mean, I, if a guy makes an accident and he makes an accident. Yeah, right. I don't but, know. No. Does zero tolerance mean – like, I, I don't agree with that, R.A.? I think zero tolerance like, is if you mean to do it, like no matter what happens, it could be light, it could be rough. It's like you're in trouble. But when you don't mean to do it, it's pretty obvious. I'm sure the yeah. ref even said he knew he didn't mean I, to. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just saying like when you say zero tolerance means like even if it's an accident, like guys still get like penalties or fined if they do something by accident. So, and, and I love, listen, I love the Nate dog. I'm, I'm a huge fan of his. I'm not saying he should get fined. Wow, just, look at it's, R.A. It's, going at the Nate dog. No, it, no, no, I'm did, saying, did, I'm, whoa, saying whoa, I'm going to the NHL. Did, I'm going up the NHL out. saying, if you say zero did, tolerance, and, and that means anything, it means no tolerance at all for nothing, whether accidental Nate, or not. I'm not going to Nate. Nate I'm, I'm saying the league is not saying it is not backing the zero tolerance policy. That's the league. Not did Nate, Nate not like dab you up in the hallway last time at the garden or something? No, like, dude, they got smoked. Like, dude, I, they got smoked that game. Like, I, didn't oh, even, okay. I didn't even go down and say hi. I was like, yeah, they got fucking whacked that Jeez, day. Want, what do you think? You know, uh, Wit sounds a little, th- sounds a little personal to me. I think, no. I think we I think we got no chance at a sandbagger with, with Crosby and McKenna. Fuck now. off. RA's <laughs> fuck off RA. But there was absolutely no, no, <laughs> everybody knows what happened with Wit's old team though. There was the other, Awful clip that went viral. South Shore Kings, this guy on the team, suck at a line. Disgrace of an organization. Just, I mean, just an absolute That is ugly not play. the same, like, they got the same name, but, I mean, listen, there's there's the younger kids. That's like a junior league team, and that kid is one of the biggest idiots I've ever seen in my life. Okay. A disgraceful exhibition that should be I, – I, he should be kicked out of hockey for years. If that was my kid – Oh my God, I would hold his arms behind him and let the ref sucker him after the game because to act like that and to go, first of all, he hits the ref first. If you watch the clip, he actually bumps into him on the boards and then you go and you see him actually just straight up sucker guy. I've never Shut seen them. anything like that. It's a disgrace. I look at the alumni and, and, and the example they set, whether it was guys getting kicked <laughs> out of their billet houses, um, kicked out of their high school, Crashing sweeping cars. their cars. I just... <laughs> Disgrace of an organization. I mean, it looked I think like they should, they should be a. They should be treated. They should be kicked out of every uh, pee wee tournament moving forward in Quebec. And it looked like he checked them basically. Like I mean, he saw him. He kind of ran into him. Then he gave him that like extra shove. That's why the, the linesman tossed him. I thought he was giving him a penalty, but someone said no. The the he was telling him to get out. The penalty benches weren't on that side. Uh, so either way, he was he was. <laughs> That's Damn. the worst. You're you're late in a shift, and it hits the ref, and it goes back the other way, and you just want you just want to clock him right in the face, but oh. you don't because you're not fucking crazy. You're a, you're a human yeah. being. One thing that's ridiculous to me is all everyone's hearing in Canada and the United States is there's a shortage of referees. They need more referees. People don't want to do it anymore. Yet. As you hear that news, you're seeing more and more clips of guys like attacking the referees and fans screaming at referees. It's 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 asinine. And the fact that people like aren't understanding referees are there to do a job. Most of the time they're getting paid very little money, if any, and they're taking abuse. Why would they want to do it? So as I've said before, in minor hockey, for kids that are younger, parents, kids alike, shut up. Don't say anything to the ref. Keep your mouth shut. And for sure, don't punch them in the face. Yeah, That's, he was uh, being for life from the I, USPHL. That was the the league. I, I guess they're not even a sanctioned league. A few people tweeted saying they're not. You know, USA Hockey doesn't even sanction them. Uh, and people, a bunch of refs, I got DM saying that, you know, oh, this is bullshit. This is why I quit reference. Uh, this was Sean Cormier 08 uh, on Twitter. Shit like this is exactly why I quit reference minor hockey. It's not worth volunteering my time to get harassed. This is the reason we have such a shortage of refs in Ontario. We have a shortage here in Massachusetts as well. And you know, uh, people stop being dickheads to the refs. It's it's a thankless job, man. And you know, you, you you can't have a game without ref. Like to make a comparison, to one of my old jobs, like you can't run a building without a custodian, or you can't run a hockey league without referees. So stop fucking with the refs. Let them do their job. Leave them alone. It's tough enough as it is. So all right, um, you should uh, you should go through the program and become a ref. 
I might need to work on my fucking crossovers first. <laughs> Specifically going left to right, it's a little struggle for me. You if should I work skate, on or, or I your been a great for when you're talking to the coaches. You could work on everything. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Eloquence over there. Yeah, exactly. I could use a lot of work on things. Uh, all right, boys. Like I said, we had a second interview. I think we should probably send it to Natalie Spooner, eh? All right. Well, first off, we do want to let you know that this next interview is brought to you by our friends at Sling TV. Boys, this Coach Prime show has been unreal so far on Boston's network, man. Uh, absolutely great stuff. It's a real fly on the wall, behind the scenes look at a major college program that's changing the game. And the new episode is on at 8 p.m. tonight on Sling TV. And if you love watching live sports, but you're tired of the high prices, it's time to take control of your TV experience. It's time you got Sling. Watch exclusive new Barstool content and past episodes of Chicklets and the Act, plus a whole bunch more. Sling is the place where your favorite sports channels like ESPN, FS1, TNT, and more come together for less. And it's the cheapest way to watch college hoops, the NBA playoffs, the entire Formula One season, and more. Sling is easy to set up, it's easy to use, and there's no contracts. Sign up now and try it absolutely free. Whatever you're into, Sling is where you can find the live sports you love all in one place. So go to sling.com slash Barstool to sign up now and try it for free. And don't forget to watch Coach Prime Episode 3 tonight at 8 o'clock on Sling and catch up on all the prior episodes as well. And now, without further ado, we're going to send it to gold medal winner Natalie Spooner. Well, it's a huge honor to bring on our next guest, she just got back from China where she won her second Olympic gold medal for ice hockey. She also has a pair of world championship gold medals and has been representing Canada on the international stage for about 15 years now. Not to mention she kicked ass in college at Ohio State for a few years. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Natalie Spooner. Congratulations on the gold medal, Natalie. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. You must be going crazy making the media around since you got back, huh? It's been a little wild, but it's been fun. I mean, I got, I actually got the gold medal right here. Um, Not a big it's deal. super fun to be able to share it with Canada and lots of little girls are going to be, you know, super inspired by this. So the more, the merrier. Sarah said it's so heavy. She needs like a, 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 a medic on staff to give her constant massages and acupuncture because of the weight of it. Right. It, it is really heavy. If you wear it for a long time, you're like, your traps get sore, the back of your neck muscles get sore. <laughs> It's worth it. It's worth it. Take take us through the 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 post game celebration. I mean, we were in the locker room the whole time. Where did it lead to? Like, bring us through that experience. Yeah. So, um, well, we stayed on the ice as long as we were allowed, and then we got kicked off the ice. So we made it to, to the locker room. Um, we partied there for a while. There was actually a few girls who had to get drug tested, so they were a little late to the party. Um, but we had so much fun. I mean. I, I think like most people from watching our team saw that we like to dance. We like to sing. Um, so the party had a lot of that in the locker room. Um, pretty pumped. And then eventually they were like, Hey, we got to hit the showers. You guys got to go back to the village. Um, so we took the party back to the village, but obviously it's, it looks a little different with like COVID Olympics. We had to stay in the Canada house to parties, but um, no, it, it was still a blast. Who who led all the dancing? Because I noticed that you guys were posting videos even before the gold medal game. Like, is that was that like a, a little ritual that you guys were doing to specifically that song? You guys had like choreographed dancing going on as well. Yeah, Missy Elliott. So um, we had a like during lockdown, I guess we were like in a bubble. Right. So we couldn't really do anything. So we'd have a lot of like Zoom activities like we did um, like crafting a vase and then we did hip hop dance and that was the dance we learned and then that just became a ritual where like we would do that before as like a warm not really as a warm-up but like during our warm-up i have to say we got pretty good by the end that like we were nailing it we so were, you're like we were, you're gonna be the next seth rogan making all the vases were you guys doing like clay <laughs> the, 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 like the clay, clay vases, vases. <laughs> yeah they i some people were good some not so good but yeah, we did lots of activities. Is, is that when you guys had time to paint your nails? Because the biggest thing that popped in all these pictures and these close-ups were on your guy's wedding uh, finger. It looked like you painted your your nail uh, gold. There it is right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was Sarah Nurse got like a nail painting kit because obviously you normally get your nails done for a big tournament, but because of COVID, we couldn't go to the nail salon. So we all had to just do our, our own nails. So that was, that was the... <laughs> 
the so money. You, no, you no, and no, your no. husband, you and your husband are going to be like Patrick <laughs> Swayze and Demi Moore in Ghost making a vase uh, when you get home. I've I've seen that scene. I can only imagine it now. You've learned a new craft. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see if he lets me put it up in the house, though. Well, I think you got to tell the story of how you uh, how you met your husband. Okay, like at Calgary Stampede. So I met my husband at Calgary Stampede. Well, if you ask me, it was at Calgary Stampede. If you ask him, it was on the ice because he was a skills coach. Um, I didn't realize it was the same person. <laughs> so until he flipped me on the dance floor at uh, the Calgary Stampede, and then, you know, it was love since then. <laughs> Usually the Stampede's like the meeting of maybe one night stand. You got a lifetime <laughs> yeah. out of it. That's I great. I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> that that is, lucky. Did, one in a million for, for, for those uh americans listening you've got to describe the calgary stampede because they might not take my word for it oh it's like a, a huge party um pretty much they shove as many people as possible into like tents um there's like bull um i don't even know what you call them not bull racing bull riding bulls bull oh, riding buddy. um uh, we met at an event called Bull Busting. That was like the name of the event. <laughs> um, and then there's like the hor- the truck wagon races. There's a whole bunch of like actual stuff that's like real cowboy stuff. And then there's like the party bit, which is what we we watched the actual horse stuff. But then we pretty much just partied most of the time. W- what's it like for him, like having a celebrity in the household Like you must be on this like insane media run right now? I'm sure you did so after your first gold medal. So like. What's it like for him? Like, how does he handle it all? Uh, he's good at like poking fun at himself. Like he sent, uh, like we all got like videos before the Olympics um, of like from our families. And like, he was sitting up at my, or we have a cottage in Muskoka. So he's sitting up at the cottage, like having a beer being like, Hey, it's Mr. Spooner here. Like his last name's not Spooner, but like he calls himself <laughs> Mr. Spooner as a joke. So like all the girls just love it. And yeah, so he just, he embraces it. How was the Olympic Village, all the other stuff? Were you able to see any other events? Yeah, we, uh, you know, during the first few games, I didn't go to many events. Some of the girls went and saw like Big Air. Um, but I went to Pairs figure skating, which like I love all the figure skating. Like that's pretty crazy. I mean, I got to be on Battle of the Blades and try figure skating. So I think I have like a new appreciation for like just how hard it is. Um, and then what else did we hit up? Um, oh, we went to some speed skating. And oh god, there's quite a few. Was we were hoping many, we could we'd be able to watch the men play, but they got out early. So too many, too many, to too many drinks. Suck on that, guys. Yeah, <laughs> don't don't remember too well. <laughs> I was a little overtired. It wasn't much sleep. Was was the food a disaster over there? Like people were saying online, or was that overblown? Like how was that situation? It, it was pretty rough. It was like, pretty oh rough. We tried god. to make the best of it, um, but yeah, like it was like the meat was either like really, really dried or it was like really fatty meat. There was one time I was standing in line and it was, I think it was like a Ukrainian guy in front of me. I can't remember, but there's like a young Chinese man behind serving it. And they were like, he's like wraps and he's trying to find out what the meat is that's inside. So he's like, what is the meat? What is the meat? And then like the guy was like, I don't know what you're saying. Right. And he like, he, he like looks at him. He goes, quack, quack, quack. And I'm behind here. And I just burst out laughing. So then like the young guy behind the counter burst out laughing. And then he's like, yeah, yeah. Like it's a duck. It's duck meat. But like, I was just, I thought it was like the funniest thing. I'm like, this is how we now communicate what the mystery meat is. It's yeah, like, I just you- make them. Still better than Subway. I thought uh, you were going to say that the, even the guy didn't know what the meat was. Yeah. That's like, yeah, that's China. We're not yeah. sure. So luckily, luckily he knew. But yeah, it, we, then we, we got into the conversation with the girls. Like, are all animal noises the same in every single country? Or like, are they different? Good question. Oh, that's an interesting. But if you do this, you got to know it's a duck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, he knew. He knew. And then he started dying laughing, too. And he could barely serve me. But it worked out. As far as uh, when you guys were uh, at the Olympics, were you guys at least to be together when you were there or were you just quarantined beforehand? Like, cause I know you said you guys were doing a lot of these zoom calls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was beforehand. So we were in a bubble in Calgary before we left. So we had a lot of zoom calls there, but then once we were in the village, like we were obviously allowed to go, we were, you know, COVID tested every day. Um, we were, we had to wear masks. Like you still have to wear masks around the village, but we were allowed to be around our team and even around like At first, when the guys came in, we weren't allowed to be around like 
any of the guys hockey players but then once they were there for a few days like when people started coming in like kind of gave them a few days and then we were allowed to hang out more you just mentioned the team. We haven't even gotten to the game yet. You ladies tore through the Olympics. You went 7-0. and uh, Sarah, get you guys on the board. You ladies on the board early. 3 nothing lead. Going in that third period, it was 3-1. Were you kind of like nervous at that point? Did you know you had it? What was the attitude in the locker room going into that third period? Uh, you know what? We, we were feeling pretty good. I think we prepared so much for these games. Like We had gone through every single scenario pretty much in all the games leading up to it um, that we knew Like we had an awesome PK. We called our PK the power kill because they were that good. Um, you know, we had a really good power play. So we were just like, let's, you know, keep the pedal to the metal and keep going. Obviously they, you know, got another one, but then with 12 seconds, we were like, we can hold on to this. And um, yeah, I think we just felt pretty confident. Um, we had been creating so much offense through the tournament and just kept, uh, kept rolling. So obviously that quote that you had before the game amplified right before, you know, the gold medal game, like, what made you say it? Did you even realize you said it? Like, did it make you a little bit more nervous and add pressure? I asked Sarah Nurse the same thing, and she said it didn't. It didn't affect her at all. It affected yeah. me, Biz. Oh. <laughs> I actually, I don't even remember exactly when I said it. I hadn't been interviewed in a few days, so I was like, I'm not sure where this came from. But, um, you know, like looking back, like we have the most respect for the American players. They're the obviously the team we want to be playing against. They're so skilled. Like they're the reason why we're as good as we are because they push us every day to be better. Right. Like after they beat us in 2018, it was like, we got a job to do here and like, let's get better. And it's always in the back of your mind. So um, I think really maybe why I said that is because we wanted to put on such a dominant performance um, just to make sure that we've obviously gone to overtimes and shootouts with them in the past. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't ever going to put ourselves in that, you know, scenario again, like we needed to get the job done in regulation. <laughs> And then obviously you end up scoring that first goal and, and, and probably alleviating a lot of the pressure off yourself for that quote. And then they ended up taking it back. Like what was the feeling on the bench when they said, nah, nah, no goal. Yeah. Obviously like super exciting, but early on in the game, we knew we still, you know, could keep pushing and just to keep the energy up. And Nursey like looked at me and was like, sorry for going offside. I was like, don't worry. She's like, I owe you one. And she literally went out, I think it was like 40 <laughs> seconds later and scored. So I was like, sweet. Thanks. <laughs> we're good now. We're good. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> so I, I was amazed, and it was, it was great to see how many people watched the game in the U.S. It was an 11 Eastern start. I think it's the second most watched game, hockey game here, and it's quite a long time. And since you started playing internationally, 2010 is, I think, when you started representing the um, the women's team. Like, What's it been like to see the growth, not only in Canada, but the U.S. as well, where now women's hockey is reaching such a different level? Yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, even from, you know, I was at the Olympics in 2014 to 2018 to now, the skill and the speed of the game is getting so much faster, like, and so much better, even every four years, um, which is pretty amazing. And I think it's only going to keep getting better because you see these young girls that get skills coaches and skating coaches, and they have all everything, you know, so early on. Uh, and I think that, you know, the numbers, the people watched our game, it's a testament to just how, you know, there is a, a market for our game and people do want to watch it. And now it's about getting a pro league in North America and making sure that, you know, all those young girls that got to see us play that, you know, were inspired by us can see us on the daily basis because it's only going to help the game of women's hockey. And we're going to get so many more of those young girls that are going to want to be, you know, playing in a pro league or playing for Team Canada or playing for Team USA. Um, so it's just, you know, hopefully keeping this momentum going and, um, you know, getting that league up and running. Well, that and getting their own Tim Hortons dolls. Yeah, were, were you, that's were, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I think uh, MPP and both Sarah Nurse had mm -hmm. uh, a special edition doll come out through Tim Hortons and obviously more brand deals to come. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about a few of those girls pushing the pace for women's hockey, um, mm -hmm. aside from yourself. Uh, MPP, is she, the, is she like the goat of all female hockey players? For sure. I mean, it's almost comical. We have to laugh about it with how many overtime goals she scored for us. Um, you know, we call her Captain Clutch for a reason, but... I mean, even in the rivalry series against the U.S. leading up, like she scored two games in a row in three on three overtime. And like we went over, we were like, how? Like there's not even an answer how, but like it's just so funny because like it just she's that good that it's like, OK, put her out for three on three, like she'll go score. And then, you know, in these big gold medal games, like she's the only player that's ever scored a goal in in the final game in like all four Olympics. So like it's kind of mind blowing how good she is and that like she does that. What's her demeanor off the ice? She seems super chill. 
she is super chill. She's super nice. Um, works so hard. It's just like a great human being, like so kind. Uh, I got to room with her at the Olympics and like, we're really good friends. Like we go on some vacations and stuff together. Um, she's just awesome. What did you, uh, what did you make of her kind of turning down or not kind of, but turning down the opportunity to maybe join that East coast hockey league team? Like, did you talk to her about it or was it an easy decision for her? What, what went through her mind on that? If you, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, we actually didn't hear about it. Like, um, obviously we were enjoying ourselves at the Olympics, so I didn't even know it happened until I got back, but I mean, kudos to her to, to throw it back to them and say like, help grow the women's game. Like, it, it's true. Like our games are not the same game. Like it's, it's different, but they're different in, in great ways. Right. And they both deserve to have that same platform and they both deserve to be watched. Um, so, I mean, like big ups for her just to, you know, say, help us grow our game. Right. Absolutely. We got to shout out your goalie too, And Renee Debian. I mean, that first game mm-hmm. versus the Americans, the preliminary round in, incredible. She was like a cat like out there. She's, she's yeah. How long have you been playing with her for? Because I know last time you won, um, what was uh, Sharon, uh, Shannon was the goalie last time. How long have you been playing with Anne Renee for? So Anne played in 2018 also. And then after that, she took a few years off. She was an accountant for a while um, and then decided to come back. I mean, you like um, Biz and Wit, you guys got to see her firsthand at the All Star game. Um, just like her lateral movement, her, you know, she makes those huge saves. Like, it's pretty crazy how, how good she is, but also like nothing phases her. Like she's the most relaxed person that like you could do anything to her and like, she'll just, she's fine. Like it's, it's pretty crazy and really cool to see. Cause I guess as a goalie, that that's pretty good. <laughs> um, but she's, I mean, she's amazing. And she held us in a lot of games and I mean, we need her. You, you mentioned she took, took some time off and became an accountant. Who, who, um, who are some of the girls who have the wackiest jobs on the team? Because I don't know if a lot of people know this listening, like you guys have to balance it where you, you know, maybe the, the, maybe the amount of money you guys are making playing hockey can't, uh, can't like help pay for your, your living. So you guys got to figure out side jobs. Mm-hmm. Oh man. I'm trying to think. Oh, like the girls on the team now, I mean, the past year, we obviously haven't, no one's really been working, but I mean, there's some in broadcasting, there's been some in like kind of media communication roles before probably accounting would probably be the best one I'm trying accounting. to think. <laughs> Maybe it's the most pretty... boring job in the world. It, yeah. it doesn't surprise me a goalie did it. They're a little odd usually. Yeah, for sure. But maybe she'll go back to accounting later on in life. Who knows? I had a, I had a, a backup goalie when I was in the EIHL who uh, worked at a, a rental car place. So we would always give him a little bit of a hard mm. time, but like not not in a bad way, but just you know it was just kind of a random job to have when you're a backup goaltender playing pro hockey. For sure, all the rental cars you needed though. Yeah, exactly. We we know the hate with the Americans is real. I mean, you you teams play each other all the time when you do like the bond storm and tours and stuff how how bad does the shit talking on the ice get does it does it get pretty nasty the chirps you know what it doesn't get too bad like we used to have a player Haley Irwin who was like great at chirping they've got a few like they used to have the Lamaru twins who too were pretty rugged around the edges like maybe I just don't hear it because I'm a terrible chirper um <laughs> like I can't think of anything like that quick um like, I don't even know. Maybe like a girl tells me I'm heavy if I fall on them or something. Like I have nothing to say. Like, um, but yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. Like it does get like heated obviously. Um, and it's rough, but no, I think we, I, one of my teammates when we were playing the Swiss, she, she had a funny story and I wish she could tell it because the way she tells it is hilarious. So this one shift, like this girl was following her like all around the ice and she looks at this Swiss girl and goes like, like kind of trying to chirp her, like, are you going to do this the whole game? And the Swiss girl looks at him and goes, that is the plan. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, so you are? And she goes, that is the game plan. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were, she told us the story. We we're like, oh my gosh. Like, how do you not just start laughing? Like you can't even chirp her anymore. It's just like, it's just like you have to start laughing. <laughs> man on man, whip. Exactly. Exactly. You get it. Wit couldn't do follow that, that in the D zone. Wit, Wit was a liability back there, so they couldn't do man on man. <laughs> yeah. Does that does that hate like going back to the Americans? Does that does that ever come off the ice, or does it always get left in the ice? Just because you, you always play each other so often, does it ever like you yeah. know with a cafeteria or dirty look something like that? No, no. I mean, we uh, like got to play together a lot too. Obviously, um, we came together with the PWHPA. Um, so I think, you know, obviously when you put that Jersey on and you're on the ice, it's like, 
nothing matters, but off the ice, like you for sure say hi and how's your day. And, um, you know, we obviously felt for Decker, like she's an amazing player and having that happen so early on a tournament. Uh, I mean, I think most of us reached out and just made sure that she was doing okay. Um, and hanging in there. It's, I mean, you never want to see anything like that happen. So we definitely are, you know, like a lot of the girls are friends with players or played with them in university or played with them in the CWHL. So there is, you know, that mutual friendship and respect. Um, but obviously when you hit the ice, it's do or die. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. we've obviously had all those big games against them. I'm sure we're going to get back to the Olympics. I was just going to go back a little bit. Uh, you ended up going to Ohio state for, for the ladies in hockey. How do you guys, uh, like, I know you play minor hockey. How does the recruiting process work? Is it different than the men? Uh, how did you personally end up at Ohio state? Yeah. I mean, I think it's similar to the men. Um, like I tried out for team Ontario and making team Ontario. And then my last year of high school was when they first started the under 18 team Canada team. So I think that kind of helped me get my name out there more, but I mean, scouts were at tournaments all the time we had or game. And then you get all the letters from the universities and you kind of narrow it down. My oldest brother played at Wisconsin. So my whole life, like growing up, I had like hockey badger dolls and like Barbie dolls. So I thought I was going to play at Wisconsin. And my mom was like, let's just go see, like, you've already been to Wisconsin. Cause like you visited my brother, like, let's just go see another big school. Um, and then I visited Ohio state and I like loved it. Um, I like, I, yeah, Tessa Bonham was there at the time who played on team Canada and she showed okay. me a great time. Uh, I also visited BU and Cornell. Um, and then I just decided Ohio state was a spot for me. So for somebody like yourself, like three Olympic games now, and then the next game's four years away, how do you decide? Like, I still want to do this. Like, is that in your brain right now? Like I'm playing again or like, cause I imagine after you've played in three different games, you start thinking like, Oh, it's four years away. Can I do this again? Have you even thought about that yet? Or is it too soon? No, I thought about it. I don't want to do it again. Nice, <laughs> I mean, when nice. you have like the experience and our team was like so much fun. Um, you know, even closing ceremonies, they start talking about Milan and we had the Italian team sitting behind us and just like got us all jacked up about Milan. So Obviously it's four years away, but, um, you know, I think about from like four years ago to to now and just how much, you know, I personally improved as a player. I still think like our team can get so much better and everyone can keep improving for those next Olympics. You're like, it'll be fun, but can we bring the, can we bring the Chinese cook though? (laughs) No, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The Italian Olympics, everyone's going to gain 15 pounds. That's the only problem. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but uh, you mentioned the Italian team behind you at the closing ceremonies. When, What's kind of your response to people? And you've seen different articles. I don't agree with them where they say, well, it's just the U.S. and Canada. Like, this is kind of ridiculous. No other countries can compete. Like, what do you think helps kind of change that in a sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it's still like there is other other countries that do compete. And we have to be, you know, good. Like you see Finland. Um, they beat us in the 2019 World Championships. Um, I think, you know, Czech Republic is coming up. If you watch Japan play even now, like they play such a structured game and they're like, they all play exactly how they need to play to win. So, um, I think that there's a lot, you know, still developing, like we're pretty lucky that in Canada and us, like we get to play best on best all the time. And I think if we do get a pro league here, like it'll attract a lot of those players from other countries that will then help develop them and be able to, you know, then bring that back to their countries. And it's going to level out the playing field a lot. Um, but I mean, I can't believe in 2022, we're even talking about, you know, taking women's hockey out of the Olympics because the game has come so far and it's only, you know, the beginning for our game. Like it's, it's only going to keep improving when women don't have to have jobs and play at the same time when they can just focus solely on training, like the guys get to do, um, you know, the level is just going to take off. As a player, do you get to round table? with, with people in, in maybe power positions about your ideas and the other girls ideas to, in order to how to grow the game? Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously with the PWHPA, it's a, it's a player's association. So kind of, you know, putting on the table what each of us think, you know, we need to be at our best and to be able to play in a pro league. And, um, then it's, you know, finding the funding and the sponsors, um, and just keep showcasing our sport. Uh, you know, we had the dream gap tour, where we got to go around to a lot of different places um, and just show our, our sport and see all the little fans in the stands and even their parents and everyone cheering. I think it just shows that there is a market for this game and people do want to watch it. And we just need to get, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, on TV, we need to get on TV, we need to get um, the sponsors, we need to get following 
Um, and people just need to know where we're playing other than every four years. People watch us. Obviously, they want to see us in the Olympics. Um, but, I mean, people, too, want to watch Mary Philippe play all four years along. So it's about, you know, making sure they know where we're playing and how to find us. Jeff Merrick mentioned him and Elliot do the 32 Thoughts podcast, how I, he, he was thinking it'd be a great idea to get some sort of like a Netflix documentary following a bunch of you girls throughout a season. And I, I, I was listening. It's a pretty good idea. I don't know if he's chatted with it with other people, but that would be cool to just see what goes into it and how much preparation and how professional you guys are in a sense of like people don't know. They just see every four years. But to get to, you know, see the day to day, I think it could be huge. I, I mean, I think I agree, too. I don't know how that would happen but um our team also has some pretty good personalities that i think just like letting the fans meet the players right like normally we're behind these cages no one really gets to see us gets to meet us um so having that and them getting to meet all the different characters we have on our team like i always say like what made this team so special is that everyone was different and that they embraced all the differences and like we had a blast because everyone was just wild so um, I think that it would be really cool for the world to meet um, the girls on the team and, and get to see their personalities and what makes them tick and how they are on a day-to-day. I always like to ask who was the court jester in the locker room? Like, let's say when things were maybe like, you know, a little bit chill, somebody would come in and, and, and crack a joke or, I mean, maybe not in the ladies case, like rip a big fart or, or <laughs> wherever it may be. <laughs> well, that big, one didn't happen. But, <laughs> um, oh boy. We had a lot, we had a lot of good, I mean, Emma Malte, she's a young one. She's just a little firecracker. Um, who's always dancing, but uh, Soupy, she's our third goalie, so she didn't dress a lot of the games. Oh, but, like, yeah. She is, like, she would come up with songs for us. Like, she'd be singing to us. Like, it, she, I mean, she brought energy and was always so positive and just, like, a light every time she walked in the room. Um, you also mentioned about like getting more in the spotlight and, and uh, you know, being on TV more. Uh, obviously, you're not shy to that type of stuff. You mentioned the Battle of Blades and you're also on the Amazing Race. I don't know if it was the North American one or just the Canada one. So Canada you've done, one, a, yeah. you've done a, a, a massive amount of stuff just away from the rink. Yeah, I mean, I, I like challenges, I guess, something new. Um, and I just kind of go for it. Uh, I mean, I think our goal going on Amazing Race was like, don't get kicked off first. And we ended up making it to the finals. We came second, but we made it there. We ran the whole race. Um, We had a blast doing it. I skydived, which I never thought I would skydive. I puked in the plane and I puked in the air and I puked on the ground, (laughs) but I did it. (laughs) Like if you watch it back, like my guy is wearing a full ski helmet and everyone else guy is just like wearing a little hat because like, I was like, buddy, you have to lean to the left because like, I'm probably going to (laughs) puke on the right. So it was not great that episode, but that was episode one. And it was, you know, great after that. And then Battle of the Blades, I mean, I got to skate with an amazing skater who, you know, Olympian Andrew Poge, and um, definitely not a little bit nervous because I'm much bigger than figure skaters, like probably double the size of figure skaters. But um, we did it. We danced. I was thinking we would just be doing spirit fingers the whole time, but we didn't. We actually did some lifts and some choreography and had a blast. Were you somebody who ever figure skated growing up or was that your first time in Battle of the Blades? That was my first time with the toe. So how crazy is it? Fell a lot. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Like you cannot go. Like you cannot lean forward. Like half the time I was skating too. They're like, I don't know how you're not face planning. I'm like, this is how I would like skate. But um, yeah, it's I face planted a lot. Like when I the probably the first like two weeks of skating, I was just like bruised all up and down my arms. My whole knees were bruised. Uh, it was just it was not good. But we did it. We did it. Luckily, I didn't. I didn't toe pick in in like a performance (laughs) who was your partner again in um in in the amazing race was it megan mickelson yeah megan mickelson and she's a played with her brother brendan yeah yeah great guy so she she's a former player she had a tough injury and wasn't able to to end up cracking the lineup this time but Mm -hmm. she's done a wonderful wonderful job transitioning into broadcasting now like what were some of the wild stories along the way through this amazing race like what's like what's the day-to-day like on 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 a competition like that oh boy okay so well first of all like you get there and you're it's pretty much like quarantine for the first five days you're like stuck in a hotel room and then they come and search your bags and they take everything that you're not allowed to have. So like you can't have phones, no magazines, no, like only clothes pretty much. Um, and then even when you're in the hotel rooms, they take the phones out and the TVs out. So you can't like find out where you are. Like you'll know where you are, but you can't find out anything that's around that you might be doing. 
So um, every leg could be different lengths, but you'd always have at least 12 hours to sleep in a hotel between. And then you start running again. Um, I'm trying to think like, I mean, it was, it was pretty crazy, but you just like went with adrenaline and just kept going. Like you didn't want to eat or drink that much while you're doing it. Cause you didn't want to have to like stop and pee. Um, yeah. You just went and hoped you made it to the finish line as quick as you could. Oh my goodness. It's like a squid games where they like throw a tranquilizer dart in your neck and then they bring it to this like secret location and close all the blinds. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not quite like squid games. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. No death though. Just games. no death. <laughs> yeah. No death. Just Have puking, got- just puking in the skydiving. Now, when you puke, then when you skydive, does the puke hit the ground first or do, or do you? I don't even know. I was, you know, I get really bad motion sickness, so I probably should not have chose to skydive. But Megan, like right after 2014 Olympics, she broke her hand during the Olympics. So we were like, whatever physical challenge I'll do. And then like non-physical one she'll do. And we just kind of assumed, okay, it was a physical challenge. So I'll do it. And then it was skydiving. So we get up in this like tiny helicopter and I'm glued between this guy's legs, like who I'm going to, who I'm like tandem jumping with. And I like turn, I'm like, I don't feel good. Like you need to unclip me from you. And then, so I like puke at the back of the um, helicopter. And then he was like, okay, well, do you want me to just take you down? And I'm like, no, you're like throwing me out the plane. Like we're, if I, we go back, like we lose, like you need to get me to the ground. So I was like, let's just go and pray for the best. And she's like, when I came down, Mick was like cheering. And then she just realized, she looked at me, she's like, you look like a rag doll. <laughs> and then we had to get in the cab and normally like how the camera works. I have to sit in the middle and I was like, I need to sit by the window. <laughs> oh, have you gotten any sort of offers yet? You know, given the, your background, you've done these type of shows, anything come in yet? Nothing yet. Anything we'll see. You- Anyone you'd want to hear from? Any shows you'd like to do? Dancing oh, with the stars should be uh, dancing, dancing with the stars should be all over you. Stars, that would be really fun. I would totally do Dancing with the Stars. I always thought like Big Brother, but I don't know if I'm cutthroat enough for Big Brother. Like you have to, I think, have some kind of cutthroat too, and I think I'm too nice for that. So you mean like yeah, split personality? Be, <laughs> that'd be perfect for Biz. Oh fuck! Oh <laughs> yeah, be shriveling everyone in the oh, house. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh what about like the next until the next games like when do you guys start playing again as a team next like what what is the whole like kind of build up in, until Italy comes I know you have you know I know you have like the the world championships every year but like how much mm-hmm. time off do you have now Well we actually have a world championships in August which normally they're in April but because of the Olympics they put one in August So we have that one coming up and then it'll just be April after that. And then, um, you know, we have, there's still the dream gap tour going on right now. We're not in it because we're taking a little bit of time off. So they got a game in Ottawa and then a game in Washington, um, coming up, uh, this weekend in Ottawa. And then I think the following weekend in Washington. Um, but yeah, just continuing that momentum and then hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, we get a pro league hopefully next season and we can be, um, competing. I know you've played ball hockey before. Any chance you can make the Chicklets Cup this summer in Buffalo? July. Natalie, we oh. need you. Yeah. I need a ringer. Need more ladies there. Yes. Send me an invite. I'll see if it fits in no. the schedule. Consider consider this your invite. Are you, are you a Leafs fan? I know you're living in that area. Are you a, a big Leafs fan? For sure. I mean, growing up in Toronto, you kind of automatically become one. Um, it's, it's I mean, it's been tough to follow while we were in China. We kind of were in like our own little world. So like coming back, trying to like catch up on how, what the world has been doing um, was tough, but definitely a Leafs fan. So hopefully I'll be able to get out to some games now that I'm back. Let's talk for the Leafs about like 30 minutes here. You guys can log off. If you guys <laughs> what do you think, Natalie? You think we're going past the first round this year or what? I sure hope so. I mean, there's been rough patches, but hopefully they can figure it out. Um, they got the skill. It's just pulling it together now. What do you, what do you think they need right now, Nat? You to um, stop rooting for them? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. I mean, I think just, you know, belief and just maybe even just like grinding it out at the moment. Like it's obviously a tough part of the season. Like it's, it's tough. So just, you know, winning battles, like making sure they're getting on teams early. Um, I could see why you say you wouldn't be good at big brother. (laughs) You don't want to say anything mean. No. You don't say anything critical about the Leafs. And that's why I respect you because they're the best team. They're going to the finals. Anything else? All right. I was going to say, what was the, the the highlight of the trip that wasn't hockey related? Oh, highlight of the trip. Probably, I mean, even just being in our rooms, like we didn't go to watch lots of sports, but we got to see um, 
speed skating and watching, you know, the guys win the short track and the girls win um, their relay, like the night before and the night before we were about to play in our finals was pretty cool and like super inspiring for us. Um, and then just, I guess, getting to meet all the other Canadian athletes, um, you know, getting to celebrate for a few days after and getting to hang out with some of the hockey guys, the speed skaters. Um, that was, you know, really fun, even though we had to stay, I, I guess like Pyeongchang, we went to all the karaoke bars, Sochi, we were partying, you know, with all of our families. So it was a little bit different this time, but still super, super fun and really cool when you get to hang out with like the best athletes, you know, in Canada who you know, have won so many medals and it's pretty amazing. Did you get a chance to check out the power plants near the, near the ski jumps? I even, didn't did, go to Big Air, but some of the girls went to Big Air. They said it was kind of a cool atmosphere, like just really like misplaced, but like pretty cool that it's just there. Yeah, because they were high from the fumes from the nuclear plant <laughs> next to the, to the ski. It looked like the Simpsons, like uh, yeah. Springfield. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. in there. <laughs> was, uh, fa- were families not allowed? Is that, was that the case this year? Yeah, so that, that I don't sucks. think China was even letting in any families. Um so yeah, like I have three older brothers and like they have a blast every Olympics they go to. Um, so they, you know, they had like a little screen set up. So sometimes after the game, you could like talk virtually to your family, but most of the time it was just FaceTime. And like, so my whole family got together for the gold medal game and my one brother drank a little too much and he has two uh, twin babies that are two years old. So the next morning he had to get up and it was still nighttime for us. So I was FaceTiming with the babies and he was like, can you just babysit them over FaceTime quick? Like I got to go to the bathroom. So I was like, okay, what are we doing? Like singing songs to them from here. Like if they do something, I can't stop them, but okay. That's the way to go. I think I'm going to take a quick nap. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Just watch them on FaceTime. And I'm in the middle of like the party, like watching them. We really appreciate you coming on and and congratulations. I mean, what a career you've had. It's going to continue and an awesome run for your team. So, so thanks for joining the show and congrats on another gold. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I mean, it was great to meet you guys in, you know, at the all-star game and the support that you've shown, you know, us as players and helping, you know, grow the women's game. So we appreciate it a lot and thanks for helping spread the word. I'll make sure. I'll make sure we get you on Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah, I gonna, love it. I'll be tweeting yeah. them at Tatum down, nonstop. On my ballerina shoulders. That was something I had to learn for figure skating. Ballerina arms. Like, how do you get shoulders this big to be ballerina arms? I'm not sure. <laughs> I have no clue what that even means. <laughs> yeah, I know that Kobe Armstrong did the Battle of the Blades, and did he mess up his knee? He was actually so good. He was. He was good. like amazing. He figure skated. Was, like, he figure skated. He was little. Got hurt. Well, I mean, you said ballerina short- shoulders. He had him his whole career. So, I mean, he had the advantage going in. Like, I was like, thank God he got hurt. Um, yeah, he pulled his, what is his quad? I can't remember what he pulled now. He yeah, pulled it's online. You, he, yeah. he, he was in like awful pain, but he's, his mother teaches figure skate and he started off skating that way. That was so my he, season. So I would have had to compete against him. So I was like, thank God he got hurt because it gave me a second place finish. Wow. Maybe there was a little tomfoolery <laughs> behind the scenes. Maybe you were messing with his blades. Couple of nicks. <laughs> no. <laughs> maybe, maybe you are prime for big brother. <laughs> yeah. Only figure scaling big brother. <laughs> sports. If it has to do with sports. Done. Done. We'll create our own. Well, Nat, yeah. thanks so much. And congratulations again. Uh, what a great run. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next one now. We're in Italy. Yeah. Are you coming? Um, if they allow people to show up and the food's not like it was, uh, in, in China for sure. Yeah, they will. they will be, a, they will be fans in, in Italy. We'll be through this by then. All right. Maybe we'll see you uh, in Buffalo this summer for a little, uh, street hockey, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that too. Okay. All right. See you Nat. Thank you yeah, so much. Thanks so much. We want to send a huge thanks to Natalie for making time for us during a very hectic few days for us. She's got back from China. She's got all these media obligations. So uh, we really appreciate her making a few times for us idiots here on Chicklets. Uh, also want to let you know that her interview is also brought to you by Cross Country Mortgage. When you're buying a home, it can feel like you're skating on thin ice. There's a thousand things that can go wrong. So you, you need a team that will help you navigate the home buying process. Cross Country Mortgage has a team of loan offices dedicated to getting you the best possible loan terms available. They have an average close time of 21 days, which is ridiculously fast. They've also got a wide variety of loan types, which means they've got everything to cover everyone. We got exciting news as well. They're giving away free Barstool and Cross Country Mortgage sweatshirts when you sign up or refi or get pre-approval while supplies last. So go with Cross Country Mortgage. You'll experience what it's like to skate on fresh ice. 
Make sure to hit up crosscountrymortgage.com slash barstool right now to take care. They'll take you through the buying process. Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, NMLS 3029. All lines subject to underwriting approval. www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Check them out if you're looking to buy or refi. All right, boys, we got some other uh, notes here, too. Uh, the Chicago Blackhawks announced that um, Bobby Hell will no longer be a team ambassador for the team. Uh, they said they were redefining the role, and it was a mutual agreement uh, in, earlier in the season between the player and them. He had been named back to the post in 2008, along with Stan Mikita and Tony Esposito. Uh, both of those guys have since passed away. You know, the team had been frequently criticized uh, during that time for having him on, given you know his history of the uh, ugly domestic violence allegations, as well as him being attributed to some, making some pretty awful statements. But I think after what's gone on in Chicago lately, it, it was uh, the obvious move to just like not bring this guy back. Uh, also, uh, great news, though. We heard uh, Avalanche TV analyst and one of my favorite players as a little kid, Peter McNabb. He said his cancer is in remission. Uh, one of the nice. well-liked guys in the league. Uh, everybody raves about him. And so, Peter, we're so happy to hear that. Ha- happy to hear you well. And uh, he didn't even literally leave the booth. He was still working while he was getting treatment. So, Kudos to him for grinding out and, and, and gritting it out. But great news to hear about Peter McNabb. Uh, we got a Mich- Mit, what do we call him, G? A Mich- Michisonk goal when a guy faced a Michigan. Michisonk. Uh, Merrimack's Ben Bra. Uh, I mean, just it was on a power play, too. So it was obviously a set play. Fake the Michigan. Talk about taking a play to make a, I'm taking a hit to make a play. Got absolutely buried. Uh, Liam Walsh was the one who got buried. But also play. You guys seen it. Any, uh, any, any chime in here? Or what? It was a it was a great set play. I yeah, mean, I've pro- seen one it of the a coolest lot now. ones. That, you, oh, you've seen it before. Uh, no, uh, well, I, I don't know if it's been not that style, right? Well, sort of. I mean, basically, I mean, I've seen the setup of where everyone thinks that Michigan goal is going to happen, and now you have so many different options coming out of it. That one was sick, but I mean, more than anything, everyone's trying. All right, well, teams are kind of looking out for the Michigan. Let's now get a guy flying in front of, pick the puck up, and it's it's it, it is certainly like changed the way teams are playing down low. When you have a guy that's that good with his hands and able to do it, you open up different options. So teams got to figure out how to defend against it. I mean, I, I'm sure the NHL teams are talking about making sure it doesn't happen again because it's embarrassing when a goal gets scored like that too. Yeah, I'm sure they were, and they, they were giving a little jersey pop too. It was uh, it was a pretty good clip there. Oh, all these kids are doing these crazy. Uh, we're gonna start seeing people doing that. What's the one that Schefter was doing? The, the gritty? gritty, the gritty. Yeah, like when when Schefter. <laughs> oh man, the old man yelling at clouds are gonna come out when guys start doing like dance sellies in hockey. We've been yeah. getting a lot of clips of the gritty. We've actually posted a few of them, but the kids are all doing the gritty. Do you, after you think the score. in the next two years we see somebody dancing after a, a goal in the Maybe NHL? The next two months, it's on, dude. Do one of these like, afterwards. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure yeah. somebody has danced before, like one time, but like doing it on a regular basis to like coin a, an on ice dance. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Like you said, Biz, old, old men yelling at clouds would be going crazy about it. Oh yeah. Uh, a couple of the notes here. The uh, IIHF suspended uh, Andrei uh, Deniskin of the UHL, the Ukrainian Hockey League, for a year uh, for his racist actions toward uh, Jalen Smerik back in September. Uh, he cannot play in IIHF events or inter- international competition in that time. The reason it took so long, I guess they had a, a new disciplinary board being waived in or signed in or all that shit, so that's why it took several months to make this decision. But either way, they tossed him for a year for being a fucking idiot and doing what he did, uh, which I guess is some good news this week. Uh, earlier, we did mention G, the Chicklets Cup. We got Patrick Shop on the YouTube. We're going to be dropping that later. Just want to remind you as, about that as well. And also, the other day, boys, was the 45th anniversary of Slapshot. It was Friday. I wrote a, a blog celebrating it uh, on Boston Sports, and that was my grind my gears. It's kind of a, a weird, obscure one for this week, but I'm sure we've all been to hockey games, and you look out, and you see guys with the Charlestown Chiefs jerseys on. You know, there's usually three of them, 16, 17, and 18. It what grinds my gears is when they put the name Hanson on the back of the jersey. Because in the movie, they, there's no names in the jersey. So, like, anybody who knows the joke, like, what you get the jersey for, they, you don't need to put Hanson. It's like explaining a joke after you tell it. Wow. You know? right. I actually right. agree with this guy right now. All right. Long, for a long time, I've seen people with Red Sox home white jerseys where they do not have names on the back with names on the back for the fans, and I think it's ridiculous. I'm with you. It's an absolute foolish look. And it, 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 it kind of goes along with when people have current Bruins jerseys with or on the back. It's like, no, 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 he didn't wear that jersey. It's kind of all the same thing, but I'm with you on this one, buddy. 
Wow, a little backing from the boys on the old GG. I don't know if I agree with Wit of not GGM. having a, a current jersey with or on it. I um, I think there was I think one you're year. Being, I think you're being like you, you. You should be at the games handing out tickets to all these uh, jersey fouls to people. Maybe do a little <laughs> a little piece on it. But uh, I 100 percent agree with the Hanson one because like, if if you know the the jersey, you know the jersey. Exactly. People aren't gonna be like, oh, oh, the Hanson. Like you know what I mean? If once you see the jersey, you get it. Like it, it's redundant to put Hanson on the back, and it's also inaccurate because like I said, they didn't have it on on the back in the fucking movie. And what I think there actually was one season with. Uh, the Bruins did have the name on the back. There might have been one season where Orr had it on the back, but if it's not that season, then the jersey's inaccurate. You got to keep it correct. Yeah, like, no, I was just saying now how they have like the current Bruins jersey, but Orr will oh, be on the okay. back. I get you. Yeah, so yeah, it's right, like not yeah. even the one he wore, which he didn't have his name on the back either. And, well, and the one it, that he wore is like sixty pounds, and you'd be sweat your ball bag off because it's made of one hundred percent wool. And, well, and if you want to be authentic, you can fucking be authentic, Paul. Big <laughs> deal if you sweat a little bit. Look at you on TNT. And, and if anybody out there has that uh, ugly ass fucking yellow poo I'm bear jersey, <laughs> wait. If anybody out there has one of those ugly ass yellow poo jerseys, that pussy fucking bear on the front with or on the back, I don't think they should be out in the garden with. No, that. they're like done. It, and it's and, just, and it's I've a, long said a, that's the worst jersey ever. It looks like the Bears taking a shit. Yeah, but a shout out Marina. Marina, our, the big time Bruins fan, the so She loves that jersey. I constantly see her saying on Twitter how much she loves that jersey. I'm sorry, Marina. You're wrong. Yeah, you're wrong. I mean, we're team meth bear here. The bear, like, crazy fucking wolfed up bear from the 70s and 80s with shoulder patch. That's the only bear we want to fucking see. Yeah, it's like a bear from Florida. <laughs> well, Charleston. Uh, we, you boys, you've been raving about this Tinder Swindler doc. Uh, what made me, it was my assignment from what this week. Make sure I watched it. I watched it, boys. And listen, it didn't blow me away. Uh, it was just another con artist documentary. Like, this guy puts, I'm a son of a billionaire, and these women glom onto that. And then they get taken for a ride. I mean, guy's a billionaire. He's asking you for twenty five grand after you're banging him for a month. Is that not that's seventeen fucking red flags right there? First off, and they they got hook line and sick of man. I didn't feel bad for anybody. I just walked away like that's that was the fucking I mean, the, 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 the nine different wire one with the girl who lost the two fifty. I mean, like you just... wake the fuck up, honey. <laughs> I Holy know. Shit. I know. He Maybe. must have ate her pussy good. He must have been throwing some tongue darts down that vag. I, nine just, different wires. She, she was taking out credit card loans. You name it. Just he's so like, he my enemies. Be, my enemies are. He's like, Dave, I need the. I need the big lobster tonight. Come on, <laughs> you get that the, credit card loan. The, the best character in the whole movie is my his bodyguard. There, that monster. He looks like a wrestler. <laughs> that guy who's got that, <laughs> like, the, the, the ketchup pack they, on the, in the in the <laughs> in the yeah. ambulance. <laughs> the picture they had of like the one picture he was, he's got the blood and then the back of the ambulance where they probably paid somebody to let him like sit in the ambulance and take a couple pictures it's just i was i was similar to you already like just an all-time scumbag this guy and what's amazing is he's still out there like living his life like doing his thing it's 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 nuts i i include the blog uh, that pat wrote at Boston. he's getting like twenty thousand dollar appearance fees at a nightclub like who the fuck wants to go hang out with this guy like you know the people still think he's a big that is the most bizarre thing about our society the fact that he's able to now like financially benefit from from putting you know other people in bankruptcy that's the one thing as like silly and dumb as it all was there's a part of you of it that infuriates you the fact that he gets to walk the street now i think in some countries when you any type of fraud like you're in for life they don't fuck around really but yeah oh yeah some 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 countries i mean people on twitter would probably know more than me and, and be able to comment to, in depth about which countries it's way more serious. I want to say in, in Sweden, it's pretty serious. Or if you Ooh, get caught with fraud. It's up, Merles. <laughs> one of those girls was Swedish, I think. I, 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 no way. I all right, you was, said, yeah. oh, okay. You said you didn't feel bad for anyone. And those girls, so dumb, but it's like they're so desperate to meet a guy. I mean, it's, I, I, I guess I don't like feel bad for them because it's their stupidity that caused them all these issues. But part of me is like, oh, these poor girls, like just totally taken for a ride by this guy and continually sending him money. And now they're just trying to like get their life back, buying off, yes. this, getting rid of this debt. It was just a horrible story. Sad. And, and he he is like a master manipulator. But the bodyguard, <laughs> that bodyguard guy, he should be in the WWE. He'd kill it. <laughs> I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the one girl who'd gotten ripped off by him, but kept him on the hook. And with she the, was with the clothes. Yeah, with the clothes, like took all of his clothes, and then ended up uh, 
basically Dang getting it. him to to admit that he was traveling back and that she was able to to call the authorities and he and then she got the witnesses demise too like the cra- the more the oh, crazier the text he was sending hey, I know. he was going fucking nuts dude that's the that's the craziest part about these people who want to go hang out with this guy who are giving 20 grand appearance fees like he was going nuts cuz these women weren't like getting duped for him frauding them so he was like flipping the script on them I think he should have a bullet in the back of his brain. I couldn't believe at the end because I was like, all right, well, these three women are on the show and the one girl's 250 grand, the other one's 80 grand, whatever. And then at the end, they said he's gotten $10 million over the course of his life. It's like, yeah, if he, if somebody took him out in the street, we should, we, yeah, we should, I'm not going to say what I was going to say, but yeah, he shouldn't be around anymore. <laughs> I think a lot of people right. would be okay with it, Whit. We Sucker blown eat. every minute. Either way, I, I, the doc itself, I don't know. I just thought it was run a mill. I, I, I know there's been a, a big hullabaloo about it, but I didn't think it was all that great. Um, actually, I, I wrote another blog this week, boy. Wait, I'm not sure if you read it. My uh, top 10 Boston movies of all time. I've been working on it forever. I, I finally got a creative burst one night after a session and, and banged out about 80% of it. And uh, I don't know. It, it seemed like it got a little bit of heat online and uh, with Boston. Did you have it? I, I saw it already. And. I guess I, I hadn't even heard of four of the movies. <laughs> so Ooh, I, which ones? I, just the, some of the tom. The, I don't remember exactly right now, but it, it read was the like, list, RA. Re, do your one through ten for people who haven't read the blog. Good. Yeah, let me pull it up right here. Hang on one sec. Oh, you can't remember off the top of your head? Uh not the order. I can remember the movies. <laughs> I don't want to fucking put you. The order. No, let's try it like, off the top of your head. Come on. Oh, like yeah, they, this is so popular during the He's rest. He's gonna read one week. that I, wasn't even in the top ten. <laughs> no. I right, know I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try it. I'm not. I, it's a. I'm not pulling it up right now until I, I. I name them. I'm gonna go. Okay, ten was um. What doesn't hurt you? The salty uh, movie. Number nine, Monument Ave. Uh, number eight. Um, number eight was it? Uh, oh, Gone Baby Gone. Uh, number seven, uh, Spotlight. Number six. Uh, I know. See, I told you this is fucking boring as fuck. So like, I don't want to. They're already tuning out. I'll, I'll just pull them up because I'm, I'm legit. No, I got them right fucking... here. I got them right okay, here. You, you had Gone right. Baby, Gone 8. You had Spotlight 7. Okay. You, you had The Verdict. I'd never heard of The Verdict, oh, yeah. but that oh. sounds like a good one. Number six. You had The Friends of Eddie Coyle on oh, number yeah. five. I've never heard of that one. You had Classic. Mystic River 4. Pretty solid movie. You had The Departed 3. I actually think The Departed's an awful movie. I think it's just such a weird storyline and like all the shootings at the end whatever disagree with you on that one goodwill hunting i absolutely love that probably would have been my number one and then your number one everyone knows where you start in it a leading role went to the uh, sag and the oscars the town so it was just interesting because some of those movies i got to check out i didn't know anything about them yeah i mean the verdict paul newman he probably should have won his oscar for that uh you know we obviously know him from reg dunlop and slap we talked about that before but he played like a drunk lawyer who's like down on his luck, just kind of his like bum scrub lawyer, ambulance ambulance Jason type. And Newman is phenomenal, dude. If you like Paul Newman and just like terrific acting, check out the verdict. Uh, the town. And the reason I went with the town, I literally had one, two, the town Goodwill Hunt. I was going back and forth, back and forth. And the reason I went with the town is like I said, it, it had an intrinsic Boston thing about it. Like Goodwill Hunt, there were four guys from Southie and, you know, bullshitting and drinking beers, whatever. But there wasn't like a very like a, a distinctive selfie thing about them. You know what I mean? There wasn't like a selfie part of the story. Whereas Charlestown, the town, those guys were bank robbers. And like, that's a very intrinsic thing to Charlestown be having bank robbers. So that's, that's why I thought it was more of like quote unquote Boston movie. That, than you Good didn't Will take Hunting, so. the Goodwill hunting as having like a South, like they're at well, L street tavern. They're like down the far, park. But you know, I think you can have four guys hanging out bullshit and like anywhere. I know they were in specific selfie spots, but like, you know, he was a, uh, genius janitor working at MIT. I just think that, you know, there wasn't a historical bent to anything, whereas, like, the town was based on actual things, actual things yep. that happened, whereas Salty... And again, I love Go Hunt. I'm not I'm not bashing it. It was number two for a reason, but the, the reason I, I had the town number one, it was just more of a fact-based Boston thing, I guess. I noticed um, you had a list after of some movies that didn't make the cut, and then you had some movies that didn't even sniff making the cut, which almost I read as, like, this: these movies weren't that good, and one of those was Celtic Pride, R.A., which is an all-time classic. If you haven't watched this movie, I'm telling you, even if you're not from Boston, I think you'll enjoy it. It's uh, it's uh, Dan Aykroyd and I think Marv from Home Alone who actually kidnaps like, the best player in the NBA and bring them back to their apartment. They're these Boston scumbags, a classic old-school movie that I, that I enjoyed. So I didn't know you didn't like that one. A lot of people did chime in with Celtic Pride. Uh, Daniel Stern, the guy you were talking about, they actually filmed that in Charleston as well, kidnapping Damon Wayans, uh, star of the Utah Jazz. I know that's a, a little bit of a cult classic. I just wasn't crazy about it. Didn't think it was a great movie. 
Uh, the other one, a lot of people chimed in on the Boondock Saints. What uh, craziness? Uh, it's just I saw it years ago. I don't know if it was young kids who watched this, teenagers fell in love with the movie. It, it's not good. It's not worthy of probably a top twenty Boston movie. So uh, either way, had to had to clarify on that. But listen. Gang, we've gone long. We've had a couple of great interviews. Hopefully, everybody listened to the show. Enjoyed it this week. And uh, we'll be back for more. So, everybody, have a fantastic week. And uh, we'll check on you next week. Have a good one. I thought The Departed sucked. Oh, fuck.